So welcome everyone to the World YMCA's Youth Voices, The Future We Want. We're so excited to welcome all of you to this session. This is going to be a dynamic, impactful event that you guys are surely to remember. Now, of course, many of you have anticipated and been excited for this experience. And so definitely show us what city are you logging in from, whether you're directly on Zoom or watching the live stream from Facebook or YouTube? Give us a shout out and proudly show where you're tuning in from today, what city, what state. We would love to engage with all of you because throughout the whole day, we're not going to hear from amazing thought leaders and inspirational keynotes from influencers from around the world, including YMCA and amazing individuals. But we're going to network, we're going to engage, we're going to ask thoughtful questions and really get started on a real dynamic about what is the future that we want. So definitely keep using the hashtag YMCA Youth Voices, hashtag the future we want, and feel free to ask questions during the Q&A function of Zoom throughout the session for today. Now, of course, my name is Christine and Tim. I'm your host and MC for the day. I'm so excited to be with all of you today. Many of you probably know me as the Chief Marketing Officer of the Global Startup Ecosystem, where we run tech summits and accelerated programs around the world, but our mission is to bridge the digital divide and prepare people for the digital age. And it's such an honor to know that my last engagement with many of you was at the World YMCA 175th annual event last year in London, and that was an amazing experience of 5,000 innovators and young people from around the world. And here I am here with you today for the YMCA's in its 175th year history, hosting a virtual conference. Can we get a virtual round of applause for the YMCA ecosystem? This is an iconic and historic experience. You guys are making history. You guys are a part of it. So bring your love, bring your energy. I hope your mind, bottle, and soul are ready for this experience because this is something that you're definitely going to remember. So I want to remind you some call to actions at the end of this program. Make sure you are inspired to connect with your YMCA. Make sure you stay till the very end so you can connect with everyone during the virtual cafe. But with that said, make sure you take real notes and real insights from what's going to come to you today because it's going to be an amazing experience that you're not going to want to forget. So with that, I want to again welcome all of you to Youth Forces, the future we want, brought to you by the World YMCA. We now start the session for 2020. Let's get a virtual round of applause. Let's get the drum roll ready because I am pleased and honored to welcome the first speaker for today's session. Can we get a round of virtual claps? It's my honor and privilege to welcome Carla Sandy, the General Secretary of the World YMCA. Let's welcome him to the stage, everyone. Let's kick this off. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Wow, what a start. Christine, since the Haiti Tech Summit last year, your keynote at the YMCA 175 in London and the African Future Summit tour, you have been part of this global YMCA family. We are so fortunate to have you as our host for this event today. Thank you. I want to welcome you all from all around the world, joining in today to listen to the voice of the young people and how they are coping with the COVID crisis, how they are responding, and especially how young people see the future unfolding. We are mindful that many of you uh, start very early or for others is very late, but we are so grateful that you are joining in to listen to the youth voices. I want to use this opportunity to say our desire is to make this event as interactive as possible. So I encourage everyone to engage in the chat. Tell us where you are from and how you are taking care of your body, your mind, and your spirit during this crisis. Number two, ask questions of the panel speaker using the Q&A function on the Zoom or in the chat of the Facebook and YouTube. And number three, join the virtual cafe immediately after this event to continue the conversation, uh, share feedback and make connection. Check the chat for the Zoom link. As Secretary General of the World YMCA, it's my privilege also to convey to you the gratitude of my president, Patricia Pelton, 
and together with uh, our volunteer, we are working to create a safe space for the voices of young people to be heard and to apply, amplify your idea and your solution and all the amazing way young people are leading in this difficult time. It's also my responsibility to ensure that no one is left behind. And we make time to consider how we can make this event as inclusive as possible. While I'm pleased we can offer Spanish translation today, we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go to make this truly inclusive. But I want to assure you that we are exploring the technology and tool to add translation into other language, y compris en français, my own language, and many others. Since its foundation, YMCA has stood for youth empowerment while supporting community and the most vulnerable. Like so many organizations, COVID have impacted the YMCA at every level, from local to global. Many YMCA staff volunteer and many young leaders are suffering. Even so, YMCA all over the world are responding to the COVID crisis with young people often on the front line. This is amazing. Young people are supporting the community with emergency childcare, mental health support, delivering food, masks, and hand sanitizer to the elderly, online workouts, and so much more. I'm so impressed by how the YMCs are responding, especially young people becoming the first responder. Thank you. COVID have laid bare massive inequality, created economic uncertainty. We are greatly concerned about the looming mental health pandemic. These have been a difficult and sometimes frightening period. However, this crisis also can give us the opportunity to reimagine our collective future together. Today, a SPET moderator will guide our young people, the youth panelists, in the series of discussion on health and well being, economic opportunity, and the future of work, climate justice, youth resiliency, and the emerging future. I want to encourage you all, all the young people, to join in in the discussion. We need your voice, your idea, and your solution more than ever. And now, dear friends, I'd like to invite you to listen to a special message. And it is an honor for us to receive that message from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Please listen. My dear young people, as Secretary General of the United Nations, I have faced many challenges. But this year, as the UN marks its 75th anniversary, we face the biggest global challenge of our age. The COVID-19 pandemic is causing sorrow and suffering across the world. Beyond the immediate health crisis, the pandemic has exposed the fragility of our societies and economies and our inability to work together across borders with solidarity and unity. Even before the pandemic, young people were demanding action and working for change for the climate crisis to other global issues. We are making our anniversary by listening to your priorities and ideas for building a better future. The YMCA stands for Youth Empowerment, and I urge you to add your voices. We need young people to keep speaking out and thinking big now more than ever. We want to hear from you and to learn from you. Thank you. Wow, let's, let's, let's appreciate that the Secretary General took time to send this uh, message to all of you. And now, I'm delighted to introduce to you a wonderful friend. He's a friend to the YMCA. And it's not a joke. She's really there. He's our good friend and great supporter to all the young people. And she is the United Nations Secretary General Envoy on Youth our good friend Jayatma Vikramanayake. Welcome, Jayatma. 
Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, such an honor to be here and, and be with all of you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world right now. I hope that you are safe and well and are taking care of uh, both your physical and mental health. Uh, thank you, Carlos, again, and the YMCA family for inviting me and my boss just before to speak to you today. And I take this opportunity to recall the celebrations of the YMCA 175th anniversary in London last summer that I was fortunate to participate in uh, the great conversations we had, the great friendships we built and the great memories we made and the great partnerships that um, it took us here. Although this year the setting is different due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the unforeseen challenges that came with it, I'm so happy to see the energy of the young people connected here today. In the chat box, I see you're connecting from Latin America to Africa to Asia to different parts of the world, coming here with so much positive energy, so many positive ideas as to how you can play a role, a positive role in our world right now and for our future. Your motivation and passion are so evident and so strong. As the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, I have the privilege to meet and speak to many young people like yourselves around the world. My job to bring the United Nations closer to young people and bring young people closer to the UN uh, couldn't be more rewarding at a time like this. Voices of young people matter now more than ever. And as the Secretary General said, as we mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, and as the countries discuss going back to normal, decisions, discussions, and solutions for bringing our common future unfold, the voices of young people need to be at the front and center of that. The coronavirus pandemic for me is yet another eye-opener as to how resilient, courageous and committed young people are as they continue to do remarkable work despite all odds. This was shown by the large number of young individuals and youth organizations, including YMCA um, local organizations who immediately adapted their work to respond to this pandemic, from the young health workers and volunteers working in the front line of the pandemics, to young scientists and innovators who are working on producing new equipment equipment, vaccines and medicine, and young people supporting each other's mental health, among many other initiatives. This proved that young people are not only the most resilient in times of crisis, but also are the most resourceful in times of crisis. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on individuals and societies have taught us many lessons and have unveiled so many new realities, exposing the gaps and shortcomings of our actions as people sharing one common place to live on, our planet Earth. It has deepened inequalities, isolated the marginalized even further, and pointed to the gaps in our systems, in our policies, and in our structures. With healthcare gaps widening, unemployment rates rising, economies tumbling, inequalities deepening, and school closures affecting more than a billion young learners around the world, young people have become increasingly concerned about their lives and their futures. That is one of the reasons why last week, my office in collaboration with the UN member states, youth organizations and various UN partners hosted a virtual town hall, which provided a space for young people to voice their concerns, share their vision for the future and call for concrete actions by various stakeholders to ensure that we don't go back to the unfair, unjust, unsustainable world we used to consider as normal before the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm so glad that this conversation today will also further strengthen those messages and further add in diverse voices of young YMCA members into that global conversation that we so desperately need. I would like to take a couple of minutes today ahead of your discussions to highlight three key priorities that young people shared last week in the UN's Youth, 20, Youth 75 Town Hall. Uh, it doesn't came to my surprise, it didn't come to my surprise that the first priority was recovery from COVID-19, including preparedness and building 
resilient societies. The second priority was peace and security, addressing global conflict, addressing ongoing conflicts, preventive diplomacy, non-proliferation and disarmament came as a top priority for young people around the world amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And the third priority was climate change and environmental protection. And I know that many of you feel very strongly about this particular priority as well. And I can't wait to listen to the panel discussions later today, where you will actually dig deeper and di uh, dive deeper into the, some of these topics. The overwhelming agreement at the last week's town hall was that we need to explore lessons from the past and reset our expectations for the future, emphasizing that we must not return to our old ways and means, but rather focus on building and reforming our current economic and political political systems so that we can avoid making the same mistakes again in the future. This points at what the United Nations is working towards, building back better. The UN was founded 75 years ago with the goal of preventing another world war and maintaining international peace and security. Throughout these years, the organization has been called upon to find solutions and respond to numerous global challenges beyond the scope of its original purpose. Today, it is answering that call in response to the current pandemic. We are so glad to have YMCA as a strong partner since the day of the founding of the United Nations to this day and towards the future. The Secretary General of the UN, who you heard from earlier, has already shared a number of policy briefs which emphasizes the unique impact of the pandemic on various populations, systems, and aspects of our lives, and more importantly, has presented recommendations for policy actions from government on how to build back better. I hope that you will get an opportunity to look at these recommendations from the Secretary General and also advocate for their implementation with your own local subnational and national governments. Putting the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement for Climate at the center, our path is charted for a decade of action which will set humankind towards a sustainable, equitable and a carbon neutral road to recovery. On that road to recovery, intergenerational solidarity, true youth adult partnerships and meaningful engagement of young people must be our core values and principles as a community. For any change to be successful, I believe that the beneficiaries of those changes should be considered as equal partners. If we are talking about building back a better world, then young people should be our first and best partners. My message to all the young people joining us today is, Claim your space, raise your voice, stand up for what you believe in, and do not settle for anything less than the future that you want to live in. I stand in solidarity with all of you, with the millions of young people around the world who are struggling at the moment with unemployment, with school closures, with mental health issues, and so many challenges, what could be considered as once in a generation type of challenges. But every single day, you wake up and you decide to show up. You show up for your families, you show up for your friends, you show up for your communities and countries, sometimes even risking your own safety and lives. Just know that our world is a better place because of you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Carlos. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm breaching the protocol of intervening, but I could not just uh, let you go like that. We are so uh, glad that you are able uh, to spend this time and share what happened last week. And I'm sure that this is going to be the connection of uh, what happened in Youth Town Hall. And I'm sure we're going to continue to work hand in hand. And please convey our, our great our gratitude to the Secretary General. You can be assured of our partnership and we work hand in hand to make this world a better place for all. Thank you very much, Jayatman. Christine, back to you now. What a wonderful, can we get another round of virtual applause for our youth envoy from the United Nations? That was such an insightful uh, feedback, especially considering, I don't know if you guys picked up on that, claim your space. Claim your space and claim it and really make a move. And so with that, 
Another round of virtual applause for our youth honor from the United Nations. And we're going to turn this now into a video from the CEO of the Obama Foundation. Hey everybody, this is David Seamus, the CEO of the Obama Foundation. And on behalf of President Obama and Mrs. Obama, we hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy as we navigate COVID-19. This global pandemic has shown the tremendous challenges and unfairness and inequities that we see in communities throughout the United States and throughout the world. But it's also shown and it's provided hope as we see the young voices and young leaders like you as you rise to the occasion and begin to take on the mantle of leadership in your communities. It reminds me of what the President, President Obama said in his farewell address in early 2017 when he concluded by saying, I'm asking you to believe once again, not in my ability to bring about change, but in yours. He said, I believe in change because I believe in you. So it's your voice, your leadership, your courage, especially as people who in this moment are leading not just as a benefit to yourself, but as a benefit to others, as a benefit to your community. That spirit of interdependence, that spirit of recognizing that we're all in it together is what this moment requires. And you know as well as I that even as we navigate this pandemic and other challenges to come, things will be hard. There will be moments where all of us doubt our ability to lead and our capacity to lead. But in those moments, and especially in those moments, know that you can turn to each other to your fellow change makers. Know that you can turn to the Obama Foundation, to the YMCA, for that community that will lift you up and help you lead others. So stay moving forward, stay in the fight, continue to lead, continue to lead from that position of values and a belief that we're all in this together. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you soon. Thanks everybody. All right, and so, I'm sure all of you are, could tell the vibe and energy of this conference is really to not only just inspire you, but to inform you. And I want to get, again, another round of applause for our first lineup of speakers, the UN Envoy for inspiring us from her perspective of what conversations are happening at the UN as we speak, from our General Secretary, Carlos Sanby from the YMCA, giving his insights on what the pandemic has done to make this a pertinent time for us as young people to stand up, raise our voices and be heard. And huge round of applause for the CEO from the Obama Foundation sharing his insights as to why we should believe not only in our political leaders, but actually we should be believing in ourselves and our capacity to bring change. And so with that, I want to transition into one of our first panels of the conference. Now keep in mind, you're going to hear from four dynamic panel discussions. And the first one is my pleasure to introduce, mental health and well-being. And this is a very, very pertinent topic because as we're all going through this pandemic together, many have raised up the dialogue, how are we able to sustain our mental resilience during this time. And so I'm really pleased to welcome our moderator, Seema Kumar, the Vice President of Innovation and Global Health and Policy Communication at Johnson & Johnson. Please give her a warm virtual applause as she kicks off this dynamic and probably most important discussion of this series. Back to you, Seema. Welcome to the YMCA conference. Thank you, Christine, and good morning, everybody. Good morning from New Jersey. I am Seema Kumar from Johnson & Johnson, and it's a real pleasure to be talking with all of you and to moderate this panel. Um, a little bit about Johnson & Johnson and about me. I focus on uh, a few things at Johnson & Johnson. One, uh, health and well-being is very important for, uh, as a largest healthcare company, uh, in the world for us health and mental health especially and well-being is really important and especially during these unprecedented times as we go through the COVID, COVID crisis mental health is something that we have to pay particular attention to. Uh, you all may know but if you don't know I just want to tell you that Johnson & Johnson is working 24-7 on a vaccine against COVID and we have many 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 young scientists across the globe who work for Johnson & Johnson, who are working 24 seven to get us to a vaccine by the end of this year or by early next year. So while we wait for the vaccine and on the road to a vaccine, we have to make sure that we 
have the mental health and resilience and take care of our body, mind and spirit and have the resilience to go through this road while the vaccine uh, is coming. And mental health is especially important because already even before COVID, mental health accounted for 18% of the global burden of disease and injury in people aged 10 to 19 years. And half of all of the mental health conditions start uh, by 14 years of age. And most cases are undetected and untreated. And depression, of course, is one of the leading causes of illness and disability among, young, among the youth. Now, you take all of this already pre-COVID and you layer in COVID on top of it uh, and all the social distancing and the crises that we're going through, mental health and well-being becomes, takes on an even more, uh, a bigger role and importance. So uh, I urge all of you to uh, make sure that you take care of yourselves, uh, be leaders in your community, uh, take care of your, your own body, mind, and spirit but also be there to support others who might be going through uh, very difficult times. A couple more words and then I'll get, kick off the panel. I wanna say that um, you know, science and technology are great solutions for us to tackle the COVID crisis. And I have full belief in the science and technology that we are gonna get through this uh, and we will get, be out of that other side of the COVID. And for us to sort of get to recovery, and build the future that we want. All of us need to work together uh, and build communities. Um, so finally, I just wanna say that I have a passion for storytelling because I think that is one of the biggest ways to raise awareness. And we recently launched a series, a LinkedIn live series called Road to a Vaccine. So please do tune in uh, to that to learn more about where we are with the vaccine uh, for, for COVID. And I'm really pleased to be here today on behalf of the World YMCA and you know, talk to the outstanding panelists uh, that we have here. So I'm gonna just quickly mention the panelists and then ask them to introduce themselves. We have Martin Johnson, we have Marlon uh, Solis, we have Phyllis Wanja, and we have Kachik Gosen. So with that, let me ask Martin to kick us off and introduce himself. Martin. Hello everyone, glad to be here. And thanks so much, Seema. Um, looking forward to um, receiving the questions, talking to you, and if you have any questions, then please put them in the chat. Um, yeah, that's me. That's great. Marlon? Hi everyone, I'm, it's glad, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm glad to um, answer your questions uh, related to mental health and, and youth. Thank you. Phyllis? Hi everyone. I'm from Kenya and I'm happy to be here and I'm ready to answer questions, especially concerning suicide. Thank you. And Kajik? Hello everyone. Uh, I'm happily representing YMCA Lebanon. I'm a social worker and I'm ready to your questions. Great, thank you. Let me first ask a question, um, the first set of questions. First to Martin. Martin, I Johnson & Johnson, we believe that storytelling is a powerful way to educate and inspire people. So tell us why you're passionate about storytelling and how that can help address mental health among young people. No worries. Thanks, Seema. Um, so storytelling is such an important way to educate and influence people. We know young people prefer to hear from their peers on issues that matter to them most. Uh, your mental health can feel very personal. And young people want to be able to share that with only people that they trust. Uh, so we know that people are going through and we want to be able to help each other by hearing what helps other people manage. Um, just like the YMCA, it takes many people to make a great organization. It also takes many different methods and strategies to manage and find what works for someone who is potentially struggling with their mental health. Thank you. And Marlon, next question is for you. Your work is about inclusion and building a sense of belonging and safety for people who may feel like outsiders. What mental health issues are unique to newcomers and un to underrepresented groups? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to mental health, it's so important to recognize that diversity is very integral to that because diversity um, is not just about culture, nor is it just a symbol, but a fact of life. And it dictates um, 
what a person or in their context, um, what, what their coping strategies are, what their sources of resiliency is, and what, are, what can be traumatic for certain people. Um, and that's not always um, understood by other, um, by other people as, um, as well. And so within the Canadian context as well with youth and mental health, what we see with newcomers is that um, there's always that assumption that dominant culture usually speaks on behalf or in totality of, um, of all, all groups that, in, that what causes um, a sense of deficiency. It implies that people, especially from underrepresented groups, are brought, when they would arrive to, to Canada or like other places um, from another region, they're assumed to be deficient because they, they don't conform to, um, to, that, um, to that sort of standard. And what's also important is that with, especially with underrepresented youth, um, there is a, um, um, there's always a pressure to constantly navigate between two, uh, two or more cultures. And that pressure bears on that responsibility to always um, um, either choose between the two and that ca can cause um, in, uh, conflict. And especially when, um, when um, inter intergeneration trauma is involved, especially from youth or from families or from people from uh, historically colonized groups, um, there is a, there's that often ignored aspect of, um, of internalized racism or, or internalized um, rhetoric where, um, where negative stereotypes are usually internalized by people and, and it creates almost like trauma, tra traumas like symptoms that are often unaddressed or un unrecognizable. And so um, even when barriers to um, social barriers, physical social or social barriers are dropped, people who do experience um, internalized racism are unable to take the step to, um, to, to, to participate in, in, contr in contributing to society as well. And so, and another thing for newcomers, when they come here, an economic status change is, is, is evident. Usually it's from newcomers who are from, um, uh, um, when that change happens, their priorities suddenly change. And so when it comes, especially for youth, their priorities for finding a job, um, finding a job, um, taking care of the family, um, having additional roles sort of takes priority over something that usually when you uh, usually would be seen as an opportunity for most youth who already grew up in, within a host country. So um, they won't have time to do sports. They won't have time to do to do any physical uh, any uh, extracurricular activities because these priorities take take place. And so there, those are some of the common um, common um, uh, challenges that I noted for newcomers. Thank you, thank you. My next question is for Phyllis. Phyllis. At J&J, we you know, are always deeply concerned about the rising number of suicide and depression among young people. And we, and, you know, we talk about medicines healing, but we're also big believers in the power of art to heal and of communications and storytelling to reduce the stigma in mental health. How does art heal and why is it so powerful to address mental health issues at a more than a physical level? Phyllis? Thank you, Seema. Uh, first of all, I'll start by saying art is therapy. And it's a kind of form of therapy that uh, where you, you use paintings, drawing, you can sing, dance, and it helps you improve your mental, physical, and emotional well-being. I'll tell my story briefly by this. When I was, in, when I was, in te when I was actually 10 years old, I was in class here in Kenya, and I remember I used to struggle with self-esteem. I used to struggle with appreciating myself, loving myself for who I am. I'd compare myself with people. I'd struggle with um, accepting myself as important. So I realized that I could draw, and that used to keep me far away from these thoughts of I'm not good enough. So one time I went to school. I don't know if you can see. Can you see this? Yes, we can see it. So yeah. this is a piece of art. You see it? Yeah. It's a, it's a piece of art I did for one month. I went to school and uh, I, went, I was enrolled in an art school where I started drawing. And I, I, took that, I took one month to draw that piece, but it was so different. I was able to connect with myself. And one thing I'll say is art is therapy. It helps you resolve issues that are deep within you. It helps you manage yourself, your behaviors, your feelings, reduce that stress that is there, the anxiety. And it helps you improve yourself 
esteem. Because for me, in as much as I knew I was not good enough, something good came out of it. And I didn't know that something good lives in me. So what I'd say is this can be used in, it's very powerful, can be used in uh, rehabs. We're actually moving to that direction. We have used it with young people. We have used it with um, different kind of people in different sections. So yes, artist therapy, and it's very powerful to bring peace and uh, develop good behaviors that are from deep within us. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful piece of art. And I see another piece of art behind you. Ah, yeah, I'll actually talk about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Yes. Uh, I mean, art, storytelling, you know, creative forms can be such, such a healing way to resolve sort of inner issues. So thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And you. Kachig, you're working with victims of terrorism today in Lebanon. You know, what mental health challenges are faced by victims of violence and how might those differ from other mental health challenges? Thank you for your question. Just a general brief that in Lebanon, there was a study that uh, was made by the Mental Health Innovation Network showed that almost 90% of Lebanese population don't have access to treatment. And this is due to limited resources and high levels to stigma when it comes to mental health. And when it comes to reaching out to someone to talk when you have difficulties or challenges. And when it comes to uh, people who are victims of terrorism, we know that they are directly linked with post-traumatic stress disorder, which mm -hmm. is a psychiatric disorder that, that can occur in people when they are facing a sudden and uh, traumatic experience that can be a natural disaster or can be a violence act. Uh, if we want to explain uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in details, we can say that it affects the body and, uh, and, uh, and the mind. So we have, like, we have different components that are being uh, targeted. Uh, a few examples, we have intense feelings of distress, we have extreme physical reactions uh, to reminders of trauma, we have the feeling of guilt, uh, hopelessness, we have nightmares, flashback. So there are many, many uh, differences uh, between the, uh, the, the mental health uh, components and the physical health that are being affected by, uh, by, by the, this, this post-traumatic stress disorder that is occurring with people who are victims of, of uh, terrorism. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to do one more round of questions um, across the panelists, and then we will take some audience uh, Q&A. So I'm going to go to Martin again. Martin, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, what the Inside Our Minds program is and how people can get involved. And also, why did you choose to work with Headspace? Tell us about that. Sure. Um, so as we were saying with Phyllis, um, there's obviously many different ways that people can use to manage with their mental health. We know that one in four young people will suffer with a mental health issue before the age of 30. Um, so the Inside Our Mind campaign um, gives voice to young people, four young people that have suffered and are managing with a mental health issue. So during Mental Health Week in October in Australia here, uh, we share the voices through video of seven young people over seven days, giving them a chance to hear from like-minded people about their struggles. Um, how they think inside their minds and the tools that they use to manage. Mm. Um, so in Australia, this is shared online. Um, it's shared in the schools and in the universities. Mm. Um, so this year we're looking for the campaign to be seen in more places and spaces. So anyone can get involved in three different ways. You can choose to run the campaign at your local level with your friends and other young people. Um, I'll put my details below in the chat once this panel is over. Um, they can contribute in Australia just by sharing the videos that I'll create this year with Headspace um, mm -hmm. with their friends and their family, um, or they can support the development um, or the funding and, of this initiative to expand and grow um, by helping with resources and, and other things to um, make it as big as it can be. So I chose to work with Headspace because I think it's really important for um, organizations to collaborate and companies to work together, um, like what Carlos was saying. Um, to support each other, to be stronger with more networks, people and funding as a collective. Especially now more than ever with COVID, this year I've chosen to work with Headspace as although that we as the YMCA have the platforms and the vision for young people, we're not the experts on mental health and they know mental health really well. So when starting any campaign, you should know your strengths and your weaknesses. It's okay not to have all the answers 
mm -hmm. um, and to work with those that, that do. We are the oldest um, non-for-profit youth organization in the world, and that means something to people. So we have the power to connect and strengthen our footprint by collaborating with other organizations and companies to share our values and beliefs with young people um, being the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. And, you know, it's a, the, the power of the collective and of collaboration cannot be understated because, you know, it really amplifies and multiplies, um, you know, individual efforts. Um, on the flip side, though, Marlon, um, you know, empowering individuals can create change at a broader community level as well, right? Talk a little bit about why that is important and why working at the individual level can have this multiplier effect for the community. Definitely. So within the individual level, there's always um, there's always um, a multitude of facets and concepts that in, that inform someone's perspectives and um, understanding of the world. And it's not just within um, underrepresented groups. Everyone in the world has been um, uh, influenced by um, diverse contexts and and diverse. Um, diverse um, perspectives and it's so important to understand that especially with coming back with underrepresented groups um, the articulation of needs is so important when it comes to empowering individuals and through that articulation of needs especially when it comes to um, getting past sort of that stereotype that a certain standard speaks behalf of everybody and I'm talking from the Canadian context where I'm from where it's usually the Euro Western standard that usually like um, speaks on behalf of everyone. Underrepresented groups can definitely benefit um, in, in, uh, from my experience, um, the articulation of their needs to, to create adaptive programming. And with that, and in order to foster that, it requires representation, representative mentorship. Um, uh, someone from like that represents someone's uh, identity and, and the very, uh, that can speak directly to that context because they are from that context as well. This helps with, um, with um, the articulation of those needs. And from there, it's not just to the fact that those needs need to be heard, but they are the venue for, um, for in the individual to access mechanisms of power and change to create social context and, prog and progress. So it's not just a symbol, nor is it a token. Those needs need to be to define and continue to contribute to culture. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, now, Phyllis, you are running a campaign, to a mass campaign, uh, to encourage people to speak up uh, and to address, you know, mental health issues. Uh, talk a little bit about the campaign and how it's going. Okay, thank you again. So, to a mask is a campaign that has been running since 2019. Toa is a Swahili word meaning take it off. And I will use, I will use, I'm a cartoonist, so I'll use art to show you what's going to, what we really mean by Toa mask. So the first thing I'll combine depression and Toa mask campaign to explain everything. So the first thing is we understand that depression is a mood disorder that comes in when, uh, you know, it's normal to be sad. But when it goes to more than two weeks and affects your normal way of doing things, that's actually something that needs to be of concern. So the first thing is this. And can you see? Yeah. Depression is quiet. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just come knocking at your door. That's the first thing, okay? Then the second one is this. Yeah. And just I'll just make, I'll read the readings and much like a mask, People hide it with a smile. So every morning we wake up in the morning, we put on this mask and go to a normal activity. And I'll put on my mask right now. And it doesn't mean that our masks look like this. It's just an illustration. So, so this is how we look like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wear a mask every day going out, meeting my friends, smiling to everyone showing them how happy I am with my life, but deep inside I'm dying. So this is it. Nobody can detect it but yourself. You know very well that you haven't slept for days. You know very well you have no appetite to eat, but what you do is post good pictures about you, how your life is perfect, and yet you're not okay. Then everybody reaches a breaking point. We are not perfect. 
we we are human beings we're not god sorry to say we we get to meet to get to we normally get to breaking points and it's still okay so that's what you're saying it is okay it is okay not to be okay it is okay to feel all these feelings and we are here to help you for that okay and then one thing about depression is that you can never hide it forever if it's not you is going to note someone else will notice that people will see you don't do things the things the things you normally used to do and this is it you won't hide it forever the truth will come out yeah and lastly this is what you are saying do not be ashamed that you are having all these struggles i'm a human being i've gone through this and it's still okay not to be okay so what you are saying is as you can see in the photo not be ashamed take off that mask because there are people who understand and in our campaign we say to our mask campaign we want you the way you are we want the hopelessness the helplessness that you're going through we want to communicate with the real you because what is suicide suicide is taking your own life people are dying at their homes people are self harming people are poisoning themselves people are buying things that can uh, can harm them why not help them and all those people who are dying by suicide they're not coward there are people who have just lost hope they didn't have any solution to look at so that they can see there is another reason to be alive so let's let's fight let's say to a mass campaign and we we say that you are precious you are important and we love you we, you're needed i need you in this life i want you to be there with me when i'm 90 it will be there so if someone dies by suicide let's stop putting it that it's criminal offense it's a problem depression is an illness and lastly so the many things i normally say about to mass campaign is this this is this can be you every day your mind is out of order as you can see we have this man here out of, you 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 can't you can't really reason your mind is just clogged and it is okay and this kind of thoughts that come in your mind all the time we have we tell ourselves that we we are ugly we are useless we 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 don't see anything important positive in our lives we just say that we can't do anything we always anxious and panic all the time it is okay call me text me reach out to me we will work together and that is what hashtag #toamas campaign is all about thank you thank thank you thank you so much you know really really appreciate you sharing this with us and um uh what a powerful campaign uh i think one of the key pieces about um mental health is about stigma and i think we need to continue to work hard every single day to eliminate the stigma so it's okay to be not okay it's okay to be vulnerable it's okay to talk about the fact that you have feelings that maybe you have someone else to talk about so i think and and to have hope i thank you so much for sharing that story i really really appreciate it um i want to now go to kaching and uh you're you tell us a little bit about your studies in psychosomatic intervention i mean what does that mean uh and how can that help yes uh i'm studying i'm currently studying psychosomatic uh, intervention and the word psychosomatic if we divide it we have uh, the body and the soul so a psychosomatic disorder that uh, we might see at many people is a disease involving both mind and body Uh, let's remind that our beautiful bodies are maps. So when we have stress or when we have anxieties, sometimes we can. Uh, it's our soul that's sending us message to our body, like there is something wrong. Especially when we don't have the opportunity to reach out. I can give a few examples: eczema, uh, body pain, uh, headache. So uh, many mental many mental illnesses can be visible to our bodies, which are uh, a representation of what's going on inside. And when we, when it comes to uh, stigma or uh, motivating young people to reach out, I would like to say that uh, us at the YMCA Lebanon, we are currently using methods to reach out to, to people, especially young people and youth. We are using our all social media platforms. on our pages ymca lebanon 
women empowering youth. And we are having every week a team. Till now we had uh, a team about communication, about mental health, about personal development. And every Tuesday we are, uh, we are dedicating this day to mental health. And every uh, Wednesday we are dedicating to physical health. And I just would like to say that every Friday we have a panel to discuss many topics and really to raise the word and to give the opportunity to young people to, to, to participate. And we are inviting those people to participate because we believe that a message is delivered quickly and smoothly from young people to young people, especially when it comes to raising awareness on the importance of uh, reaching out to someone. And you can follow our work on all our social media platforms, YMCA Lebanon Empowering Grid, and you can interact with us as well. Thank you, thank you so much. I think we have maybe a couple of minutes to take a, a, a few Q and A's. Um, so let me um, let me take a look at cup, uh, one or two of the questions. I think one question from Pascal Rosenthal is: um, How do we make therapy relevant in respect to it being a preventative care uh, treatment? Does anyone want to take that? How about you, Martin? I don't think I should speak for that one. Anybody else wanted to, to, to take that? Well, let me maybe let me take that. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I think, at, at least Johnson & Johnson, as we look at the entire spectrum of mental health and how to address mental health, uh, we look at therapy as well as uh, you know, both medicinal therapy, but also things like art therapy and storytelling, sharing of experiences, uh, all of it together as a whole integrated way of looking at mental health. So everything actually has its place. And so if you combine all of that, therapy, supportive care, medicines, um, but also, you know, different forms of therapy, as we just heard the example of art therapy, that that kind of holistic way of uh, addressing mental health is, is what's, what's required. And I'll take one last question um, here, and then I think we should move on to the next panel and I'll turn it back over to Christine. Um, I think uh, uh, what the question that is coming from Mary is, what are your biggest challenges to having your voice heard and your ideas implemented at the YMCA? Um, anybody want to go? I could uh, speak briefly about that. Yep. Um, I think um, always having to um, sell or propose um, your um, your initiative is constantly yep. like um, a big pressure, um, and um, and usually that um, that creates a bit of boundaries um, when it comes for youth to um, be able to propose their ideas. So constantly always have to sell their idea to the next person, to the next person, to the next person is usually a challenge, and uh, having to ed educate everyone on that initiative. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I think I could. I think I could probably go the same as Marlon there. Um, having to consistently sell your message on and on is quite difficult. But obviously, with these types of platforms, getting your voice out there about these types of campaigns is is amazing. Um, and to be able to collaborate with people like Phyllis and Marlon and Kaching is um, perfect it, because then you can actually share those ideas and be able to bring them together and kind of um, use them all at the same time and in conjunction with each other to um, create a stronger mes message and um, work together, so yeah. That's great, that's an excellent tip. And I think it again speaks to the, you know, the power of the collective and to the community, the YMCA community and being able to rely on each other and run ideas by each other. So I know we're at time or over time, so what I want to do is to turn it over to Christine. But before I do that, I just want to say the um, all the panelists. There are many still many questions on the on the Q and A box. So if you could go in there and and answer that. So uh, to those who are asking the questions, we'll make sure the Q and As are answered. So thank you. With so that, much. Christine, back to you. 
All right, can we get another round of virtual applause for our first panel of the day, health and well-being. Of course, there was a lot of amazing insights and very vulnerable feedback on this pertinent topic. And so thank you so much. Again, another round of virtual applause. And I wanted to transition now really quickly into an encouragement video to lift up our spirits on this conversation from Elisha London. Please see the video now. To all the young people out there, hi, my name's Alicia London. I'm zooming in from London, and I am the founder and CEO of United for Global Mental Health. We're a proud partner of the YMCA, and it's a privilege to be speaking to you all here today. Now is such a difficult time for so many, especially young people all over the world. You may be feeling sad, lonely, anxious. You may be struggling to hold on to hope for the future. You may be grieving and I'm so sorry and wanted you to know that you are not alone in feeling this way. So many others are feeling the same, even I am, sometimes every day. This may be something that you're experiencing for the first time or it may be something that you've experienced before. I know certainly it is something that I have. Seven years ago, I suffered a trauma that had me living with PTSD and depression for a number of years, even to the point of not wanting to continue anymore. And it was in these difficult times, the love and kindness of friends and family, the professional support I was able to receive and learning how to hold on to hope for the future, even when it seemed impossible that got me through. And not only did this get me through, but it opened a different path forward, a better one than one before, and certainly one that I could have ever imagined in the midst of those most challenging hours, weeks, and months. Right now, we're seeing people all around the world, especially young people, struggle with their mental health. And just as I personally saw in my darkest times, right now we're also seeing humanity fight for one another. So as we hold on to hope, as we work together to not only end the pandemic, but also build back a better future. You are so important in this. Your actions and your voice are critical. I know it's hard for so many and everything seems to have changed. Right now, we need the hope, the creativity and the vision of young people to lead us forward. Our world is better and will be better simply because you are in it and you are contributing to the world we want to see together. The YMCA stands for youth empowerment and I would love to encourage all young people, no matter where you are in the world, to hold on to hope and to be a part of the solution our world needs right now. Support one another, reach out for help just as I did if you need it. And most importantly, remember that your voice, your actions, your ideas, your leadership are more important now than ever. Thank you for all you are doing. And I hope we'll have a chance to meet in the flesh sometime soon. All right. What an amazing way to close out the first panel of the day. And I think hopefully that ended on a positive note for many of you to understand that we are all in this together and there are resources and opportunities for you to get back on track and of course, such a pleasure to have this first panel moderated by Seema Kumar. Thank you so much to the panelists for your insights. And now we're going to actually transition into our first coffee break, right? So please feel free to network and chat and enjoy because we're going to be back here in five minutes and you're not going to want to miss the rest of the sessions today because as a reminder, we have three powerful sessions coming up a couple of cool precise surprises that you don't want to miss so feel free to stay on let's chat let's network we'll be right back at it in five minutes see you soon everyone and a round of applause again to the first series of panelists and thank you again for moderating that amazing and pertinent panel on mental health and well-being see you all soon let's network and chat and don't forget the hashtag the future we want
So I see a couple of great comments as people transition to networking and engaging. As a kind reminder, keep showing where you're from, what city are you calling in from. Use this a networking opportunity to connect with each other. Give feedback on the session. What were your thoughts? What are your feedback? You know, we want to welcome all the energy and love and perspective. I saw people get emotional on the chat. Right now we're in networking break. It's just a coffee break. Go grab a drink. Go grab some tea. You know, go get a, a bathroom break. Just definitely use this time to get a little bit of a reset. But while you're at this, definitely feel free to connect. And a reminder that the virtual ca um, cafe will be happening at the end of the day session. So you want to stay to the end. So again, shout out where you're coming in from. I see Ethiopia's in the house. I see Japan. I see Mexico. I see Kenya. Wow. I see Haiti. I see Ghana. All right. A lot of love. Brazil, Minnesota. All right. Now I see some love and engagement. All right. So as we're waiting for people to come back on for the networking break, again, we have four more minutes till we're back live to introduce the next panel. Where are you coming in from? This is such a diverse. Chicago, Zimbabwe, wow. Mexico, again, Peru, Lebanon, Zimbabwe, Wow, Philippines, Ireland, Norway, Sri Lanka. This is the world coming together for the YMCA's Youth Forces. This is the conference that's bringing all of you together to talk about these pertinent topics. Let's keep that engagement going. I see Rio de Janeiro, Zambia. Wow, Lima, Peru. Another one from Madagascar, Niger, Hong Kong. This is the energy and the love that's on this engagement. How's everyone feeling? How was the insights on the first panel? As we wait three more minutes until we're back live again. Wow, coming in from Japan again, citizens of the world. What feedback do you have for the panelists? How shocking it was. I saw a lot of people giving, um, sharing their insights and their experiences on the chat feed. Say it was awesome. Wow, amazing, amazing, amazing. A lot of insights. I hope the panelists are seeing this feedback. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And of course, some of you are very vulnerable in sharing your experience with mental depression, your experience trying to build your mental resilience, especially during this time. Amazing to see that some of you have been able to be vulnerable to share that insight on the chat feed. Amazing greetings from South Africa. Amazing insight. So again, we're going to give you guys two more minutes here before we come back live to kick off the next panel. Again, we have three more exciting panels coming up. You're not going to miss this. Enjoy. Again, as a reminder, grab some drinks, grab some food, take your break, and come back live in three minutes when I kick started on the next panel. Keep the energy going. Introduce yourselves. I see it, I see it, I see it. Seems like you guys don't want this break. You just want to network with each other on the chat feed. And shout outs and big love to those of you who are live streaming from YouTube and Facebook. Amazing to have you with us as well. Don't forget that your questions are being fielded into the Q&A. And the next panel, I would love to welcome all of you when you hear the sessions. I'll be fielding those questions for you guys when you interact with everyone on the Q&A. How many of you are excited for the next panel that's going to come on in two minutes? How many of you guys are excited? All right, a couple of excitements coming up. Now, the next one is going to be a really, really, really fun panel. It's about the future of work. So hopefully you guys are excited for what's going to come on. It's going to be moderated by a really amazing co-founder of Forbes 8 and Amos Winbush. So I hope you guys are getting excited for that. Start from now to get your notepads ready, because I believe that the content from this session is definitely going to be truly dynamic. I see a couple of loop loops on the chat feed, right? I see some excitement. Let's get the energy up. Let's get the energy up. We're all here, mind, body, and spirit to enjoy the insights from this conference. We're going to go live in one minute, 60 seconds. Let's do this countdown, 60 seconds, until we transition. 60 seconds, and people are still shouting out where they're coming from. Now we're at 50 S. Yes. yes, okay, let's help me do the countdown. Amazing. I see people helping me with the countdown right now. We got 53 seconds left. Let's keep it going. Let's keep the energy going. We're going to the next panel. Are you guys ready? We're at 49 seconds. I see everyone from around the world. You're getting ready for the next panel. 47 seconds. Look at that. Look at that. People are getting ready. 30 seconds. Are we going to jump to 30 seconds? I see the energy. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right. We're at 29 seconds. 29 seconds. Look at that. We have, this is probably the world's first virtual countdown being conducted through Zoom chat. 
eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back, everyone. We are back for the next panel. Hopefully you guys were enjoying the first series of panels, videos, and keynotes. I mean, you heard from a world round around tour of perspectives on different ways that we should be embracing the future, how to be empowered, mental resilience, so much content. It was just the first hour. We have more to come. So really quickly, I want to transition to the next encouragement video by Donald and Steve Forbes. Please welcome the next encouragement video before a kickoff. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Donald Kaberuka. Uh, chairperson of the board of the Global Fund. I'm pleased to meet you and to thank you for what you do in your countries and organizations and for your support to the Global Fund. Your voice for a better future, your ideas, your leadership, your partnership to the Global Fund is critical. I want to say how grateful we are for your support of the Global Fund, but also community mobilization. COVID-19 is a threat to health systems worldwide. It will be years before we know the full damage. But we know now that it will exacerbate uh, mortality from existing pandemics. With the three diseases, the TB, malaria, and HIV AIDS, as you know, kills about 2.7 million people per run. Uh, indications we have now show that the malaria cases may double, and TB and HIV AIDS may be up. 20%. So we and you have work to do together. The second thing I wanted to say to you is that contrary to popular perceptions, young people are not immune to COVID-19. There is no room for complacency. There is no evidence uh, for that. But in any case, it will disrupt uh, lives and uh, opportunities for young people everywhere. So we need your innovation, your master of technology, your voice to ensure inclusion of all communities, including those affected by the three diseases. The Global Fund has responded quickly to COVID-19 to mitigate impact. Uh, the fund has made available $1 billion to fight COVID and mitigate uh, the impact on the three diseases. As of today, $138 million have been availed for health supplies and for health workers. And the Global Fund is partnering with access uh, to IG tools to ensure uh, innovation. COVID-19 is a threat to all of us, to livelihoods, to lives, but it can be beaten if we all work together. Your role is critical, and I want to assure you of our full support in what you do in your communities, in your countries. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Greetings from New Jersey, United States of America. I'm Steve Forbes, Chairman, Editor-in-Chief of Forbes Media. Well, greetings to all of you around the world. During these difficult times, we need the help of young people around the world. And thank you to the YMCA for making this possible. Your insights, your questions, your curiosity, and your leadership to help out are needed as never before. So don't be bashful. Pitch in there. We need you. Thank you. All right, how was that? I mean, so far you've heard video inspiring messages from the UN Secretary General, the CEO of the Obama Foundation, the president of the African Development Bank, and now the founder of Forbes Magazine. Truly an amazing lineup of powerful influences from around the world. And of course, we kicked off the day with the mental health and wellness panel. So now that your mind and body and spirit is in, now it's prepared to do the work. The next panel session that I'm pleased to announce and introduce is the economic opportunity, the future of work panel, moderated by the infamous Amos Winbich III. Please give him a warm welcome as he kick off the next panel for all of you on the future of work. Let's get the virtual round of applause going. Amos, over to you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you so Let's much. Get it. Let's get the energy. I don't, I don't know if you guys can hear me, um, but welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time to to actually be here. That's the, that's the first step in making true change. Uh, my name is Amos Wimbush III. I'm the founder and CEO of AW3 Media Group and co-founder of Forbes 8. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that the future of work is bright, uh, but only if we recognize and, 
acknowledge the calling to be the light uh, and the salt of the earth. So we must not, you know, take this um, uh, this time and approach it with fear. Um, it's it's really a moment to activate uh, divine rest. And when I think of rest, I think of it as as an acronym. The R, recognize. The E. Uh, engage, the S, surrender, and the T, trust. So as a believer and part of the body, we're called to sit atop the seven mountains of influence and uh, not to control them, but to be an example of how to walk out uh, discipleship. Um, and for me, when I read uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, 13, uh, it clearly says that we're called to be the head and not the tail. So as believers, um, we are called to reign in every part of life. And that doesn't mean, again, to lord over others, but to to, to, to serve with love and through righteousness. So economic uh, opportunities and equalities uh, and the future of work rests in our hands uh, and it must be defined every day uh, by our actions and activities. So uh, when we talk about those seven mountains of influence, we're talking about government, media, entertainment and arts and business, education, religion and family. Um, and if we aren't occupying those seats yet, um, our responsibility is to ensure that we're praying for divine guidance for those who are occupying those seats and actively walking in our given purpose and calling to affect uh, change in our own circle of influence. So uh, Benjamin Rush said something that often speaks volumes to me. He said, uh, nothing can be politically right that is morally wrong. So in this moment, we, we have no space to wade in the muck of fear. Um, and this is a call to action. So on our side, we have uh, some, some news within, uh, within Forbes 8. Um, within the next couple, you know, the next coming weeks, um, I'll be debuting uh, a six month free model for the network, uh, which completely removes the barrier of entry um, into the platform. Our goal and our mission has always been to support global entrepreneurs and business leaders uh, where they are. Um, and this action directly acknowledges the financial hardships many are facing while also acknowledging our role uh, to support the need for access uh, to opportunities and knowledge. Um, so during this time, we'll also debut 10 new series, which we're actively working on now with uh, countries all around the world to not only uh, address the current environment, um, but help usher us into a deeper, more thoughtful and authentic community. So uh, with that being said, we're excited to move into the next phase of our uh, entrepreneurial journey with our partners um, and leaders around the world like you. So um, let's get started. I, uh, I'll uh, take uh, a quick moment to um, acknowledge our panelists. Uh, let's welcome Raquel. Aubrey May, Christiana, Justin, and I'll, uh, sorry, Jonathan, and I'll ask uh, them to do a brief intro. Welcome. Hello. Hi. So, Raquel, I'm very happy to be here and speak to everyone. I'm very happy to see Miss Christine again. I want you to know I have decided to grow up to be me and no one else. She'll get that. Um, so we work in the Charlotte YMCA, the 15th um, biggest city in the US now, it just came out. Um, and I work specifically with the Parents as Teachers program doing home visits to moms, dads, Spanish speaking, and also from other countries. Um, and it's very important, the work that we are still able to do throughout the pandemic. So I am looking forward to sharing some insights there from the Charlotte perspective. Yay, yeah, Raquel. Who's next? Aubrey, you want to go next? Yeah. Go, first. go for it. Okay. So good evening. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Aubrey May Villanueva Atas. I am from YMCA Philippines, YMCA of Albay. So uh, I'm very excited to share my thoughts and experiences with you today. So and entertain some questions. Yeah. Glad to have you. Thank you. Cristiano. So hi everyone, my name is Cristiano, you can call me Chris. Um, I'm from Brazil, from the YMCA of Brazil. I'm an entrepreneur and, and I'm a volunteer at the YMCA and, and I'm very glad to be here and discuss with you guys those unknown 
uh, times that we're going to be going into from now on. Thank you. Last but not least, Jonathan. Well, hello. I'm Jonathan from the Netherlands. And I am also going to talk, I'm also going to answer your questions, and I'm also going to respond on work-related issues. Um, really happy to be part. There we go. So <clears throat> that is our uh, distinguished panel. Um, and I'll jump right into it. So just to let you guys know that um, my moderating uh, methods are free flowing. Uh, I typically won't call anyone and I'll just allow you guys to jump into it. So the first question that I have is, uh, what insight would you like to share on staying rooted in community um, and while also having your pulse on the now, specifically around economic empowerment and access to opportunity, understanding the societal structure is completely being reshaped around us? I'd like to answer that if that's okay uh, with the group. Um, you're actually speaking to something that I recently was reading in this great book that I want all the youth to look into. It's called Making Neighborhoods Whole uh, by Wayne Gordon and John Perkins. And it speaks to um, making sure that we are pouring back into our neighborhoods, not just giving handouts and empowering people, not enabling them. And so um, in Charlotte specifically, we have been already before all of this started working with the upward mobility scale, working on getting families out of poverty. And then this just kind of took it to a whole nother level. And reading the book reminded me that um, not only do we need to continue to pour into our communities with resources, but we need to continue to pour in with education and also reminding them that they can do a lot more than they thought. Um, and in that, it, it's more or less like the parable, and I really appreciate you bringing the word into it at the beginning, because yes, we are Christians. Um, you know, do you wanna teach a man to fish? Or do yeah. you wanna give him fish, right? So our mindset is to not only go into these homes, we do home visiting, to bring resources, but to remind them, hey, you can do this, you're already doing that, why not get paid for it? Um, your children can help with certain things and um, obviously being mindful of child labor laws. But of course, we want to empower, not enable. I know. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and so with that being said, you know, here in Charlotte, we're doing a lot of work even still with some of our virtual restrictions um, video wise and, and making sure that we remind them you are your biggest resource. Yeah. So good. That's so, so good. Um, if I could second that, I, I would second it and third it and fourth it because I think um, it is it is the new structure. It is the new currency, and um, that's how we remain connected. So, anyone else want to want to take that? All right, cool. Go for it. Well, I could say that um, I do believe that um, in terms of giving back to the community, especially in these difficult times, we must keep in mind that nowadays the um, opportunities we have to learn new things are really fast. They are larger than ever before. We're not even restricted to our local libraries or to our local schools. We can even learn uh, and teach things in our own context. For example, as we're doing now over great distance. And I think that's one of the great tasks um, that I could think of that connects to what was said before that um, we can build up stronger communities by, well, just letting our own curiosity stream and letting our own curiosity find its way. Yeah, that's a really good one. I um, so in my signature, anytime I send an email, uh, there's a there's a verse that's at the bottom, and it's the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Um, so this uh, this next question is really near and dear to my heart. So how can we stay connected um, and finding intimacy in our work um, and discovering access to, you know, to economic inroads, even with elements of isolation being present? Well, I, I, um, can I jump into that? Uh, I, I was actually thinking about that, Amos, and, and I think one of the things that the youth need we're talking about even before epidemics is having a sense of purpose. 
So if you don't have a sense of purpose, it, it doesn't matter where you work, if it's in, in, in isolated or in an office, it doesn't matter where you are, you probably won't be happy, you won't, you won't be uh, enabling people to help you to do your job. So I think one of the things people have to understand is uh, uh, this that's happening right now, it's probably gonna take place for a long time and you, you're probably gonna change the way we work and you're probably gonna have to work more uh, isolated than you were before, but uh, although you are connected online, but you, you were more indoors or more in, uh, in, inside yourself. So if you don't have uh, a sense of purpose, you probably won't have uh, uh, happiness where you're doing your job or whatever you do. So I think that's, that's a, a, the thing that I think about. It's a very good point. Sure. Aubrey, did you want to jump in? On yeah, I'm going to share something. Like, um, here in us, we call it the new normal. Like, people started to work from home. And it's, like, very different because most of us want to, like, go to the office. But I think most of the people are uh, now adapting the new normal, started working at home. And I think because more people are passionate about their work. And for us youth, I think because we are more creative to find solution on things. So I think this new normal is um, being adapted by young people. I, I, I agree with that. I think this new normal is, or this new reality is being adapted by young people, but it's also a reset time for us where we can literally sit down and disconnect calling from vocation. Like, you know, we have an opportunity um, when we talk about economic opportunities and the future of work to really, for the first time possibly since the Industrial Revolution, to really create uh, channels that best serve our brothers and sisters all around the world, regardless of what, um, you know, class system they operate under. So that separation of calling and vocation is, um, is, is really a must. We, we have to start thinking about sharing more calling and the vocation is intertwinable. Um, the third question that I have is uh, the power of societal and economic advantages are generated through building links across all boundaries, right? What insight would you like to share to help youth around the world with ways on how they can advocate for their fellow brothers and sisters during COVID-19 and thereafter? I do believe we can work to better the position of other people by making use of, well, the supplies, the resources that are offered to us. And we, you, you just said that since the uh, industrial revolution started there has not been a moment in which we had more opportunity i would say um to make our voices heard making your voices heard for example through zoom for example through facebook or social media but i would personally go even further and say that um, now it's more and more easy and possible to have friends all over the world um, it is it has become more and more easy to share information to share knowledge to share um the lessons we learn every day in a normal context. And um, if we share, and if you share, and if the neighbor shares, and if everyone shares, then at some point, the, the, the whole of people will start to learn. The whole of people will um, come to the position of learning, learning, learning how to fish. That's a good one. That's a good one. And maybe even we can dive into it a little bit deeper um, in your capacity uh, within the roles within the YMCA, what 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 have you identified that we can right now in your own social influence that you can start pulling out? Um, well, Emma, I'm sorry, Raquel, go on. Well, I just want to very briefly quote Miss Christine again and say that you are your own biggest advocate and you don't need permission. And things like this, the minute we were asked, everybody on this panel, they said, do you want to speak to the youth we all stepped forward, we did not hesitate. So things like that, I would say that, again, piggybacking off of Aubrey, the youth are, are especially equipped and adaptable for this time. Uh, just put yourself out there 
and yes, you're going to fail from time to time. Yes, there are going to be challenges, but you don't get to where you need to go and you don't advocate for others by staying silent. So yeah. that's, that's all I have to say about that. It's a good one. Yeah, well, um, and Amos, I, I was reading, uh, you probably guys know about uh, Yuval Noah, the guy who wrote uh, Homo Deus, and he, he's, he's talk, he talks a lot about the future. And he's saying that probably we're going to have to choose between two bets about uh, uh, national, nationalism, isolation, and global solidarity. And the, those things that the YMCA know how to do it. The, the YMCA knows how to be solidarity about, uh, around the world. So um, if you isolate the, the, the countries, you're probably going to have a, a local business grow, right? So that's going to improve all of the, the opportunities that the youth people can have and uh, as well improve the wine, say, work in locations and in, in, inside uh, their own countries. And if you have a, a global solidarity, that's going to make sure the, the job that we do uh, at the wine, say, is even more, uh, grows even more. So um, that's pretty much it. I just want to say that. It's a great point. Yeah, may I add something? Sure. Yeah. So I think one of... Uh, our strength to use our voice is also using, aside from our creativity, is using our entrepreneurial mindset to combat these economic problems uh, by starting uh, online businesses, digital marketing, and even digital commission work. So this is one way to share to other people uh, what we want to combat this pandemic situation when it comes to economic problem. Yeah. Jonathan, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I wanted to say, I, I totally agree with what Albright just said. Um, and it's kind, of, it's kind of intriguing, this entrepreneurial mindset. I think that's also a thing we can recognize in our own lives, uh, in ourselves, of course, but also in, in our communities, with our close friends, for example. And I think we all have the possibility to, well, to, to interact with it in a positive manner. So if people have a good idea not to immediately uh, shut it down, but rather to to be be, be um, actively towards improvement, to in actively think towards how to make something work. And I think that's something we can do all together, even across boundaries. Entrepreneurial mindset, you know, just being a co-founder of, of a television network for entrepreneurs um, and traveling the world, we have noticed, and, and it is part of our core, that the entrepreneurial heart doesn't change. What fundamentally separates um, the, you know, the cream from the top is the infrastructure and the system that those entrepreneurs, those innovators are creating under. And during this time, we have an opportunity as young people and as leaders in our own social, in our, our circles of influence to ensure that when we rebuild those roads, that those roads are inclusive and those roads have offshoots or alleys attached to them that are easily accessible um, for every person, regardless of who they are and their skill set. One thing that I go back to say is that, you know, my pinky toe is no more important than my thumb. My ear is no more important than my kneecap. We are all part of the body. And if you chop one of them off, then everything doesn't work really well. So as, as part of a body, we have a responsibility to each other to, to ensure that everyone is well. Um, and the final question I have is really around uh, the future of work. Uh, many people are afraid of the future of work, and I think rightfully so. Um, I would like to say uh, or ask if you could share one call to action to encourage uh, and activate innovators and young people as they create goods and services uh, and companies around the world. Um, we know that you know, economic opportunity isn't a passive product uh, of excellence. It's an active participation. Um, so could you share us, you know, share with everyone what that looks like? And you know, what, do you, what do you anticipate uh, that journey being? Uh, I think specifically speaking to the youth of the why, make sure you bring everyone with you. If you have expertise in social media, in technology, if you, you know how to use the, the webinar and the Zoom uh, 
technology more than your colleagues and you see them struggling, you know, bring them on board, be a support, um, start even little tutorials, um, making sure that we don't go into this next phase of, you know, 75% technology and 25% in personal contact with fear. We can go in and say, hey, we can save a lot of energy we were wasting before. We can work smarter, not harder, and, you know, sell our colleagues um, on it who are, you know, maybe a little older than us, maybe a little bit more hesitant. Maybe this is terrifying for them. So just a reminder that this may be exciting for some of us. I know for me personally, I was like, yes, I know how to do all of this. <laughs> I was like, yes, I don't have to do more. But I had some colleagues that were genuinely freaking out because they were like, I've never done this before. And so my, my advice and my wish for all the youth at the Y to do is to, to take every, grab everyone else's hands and bring them with you. Don't forget about them. Make sure that they're aware of what's going on. And remember that, like uh, Chris was saying, this is solidarity. We, we're all in this together. It's not a competition. It feels like it sometimes, but it's not a competition. And I, I, want, I want to just add to that, Raquel. Thank you for that. And I, want, I just want to say that we all are scared, right? We all are scared. All of us in, the, in here are scared about what's going on after. But the change is one of the things that we we have sure it's going to take place always. Uh, if, you, if you look back for the past 100 years or so, we had two world wars. We had flu. We had the men went, went to space and so. So the, the economic change in a whole lot of different ways. And we all adapt, we always adapt. So uh, uh, I like what Aubrey was saying, like uh, the entrepreneur thinking is one of the things that we're probably gonna have to improve even more. And not just that, uh, um, you, you, the, the, the way we think about job and work, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's not jo only a job, people are, have to understand they're gonna work. So uh, maybe you, 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 uh, uh, you're always thinking about, hey, uh, my, hour, my work hours are set. And probably this will change. And not, not only that, you're not going to work with your arms anymore because you have AI, you have robo robots, you, you have a lot of other things to, to happening right now. So you're probably going to have to work a little more with your brain and online and social media and stuff. So change is one of the things that always happens. So yes, be scared, all right? But make sure you, you're going to adapt for sure. Great call to answer. Okay, everyone has to answer also. Floor is yours. Okay, so I think the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 really affects us. Uh, it has negative impact on economy, education, livelihood, as well, uh, well-being, and young people specifically, uh, specifically are very much affected because of this. Um, because of school closure, youths are more youths are frontliner. Um, some young professional loses their job some practice work from home, some also experience no work, no pay policy. But I think young people are very optimistic and innovative. So I think because uh, we want to use our creativity to contribute to the solution. And I think our practice in our local Y together with our youth volunteers, uh, we use this social media platform to bring everyone to be connected again to their work and how to establish their life again um, even this we are practicing the new normal so we have this um, uh, one concrete example of activity that we're doing that we established the why advoca uh, this is under wells fargo that we uh, showcase the products of micro entrepreneurs in our locality because we want to help them how to um, sell their products because some of us here in the Philippines don't have access to internet which is very much needed uh, as of today so we help these uh, farmers and um, and young uh, young entrepreneurs to sell their products in order for them to uh, regain again their um, work and their businesses so we also have uh designing of new programs how to help these uh young entrepreneurs to establish their future careers because again some loses their job and we have this online e-commerce session and financial literacy session uh literacy sessions uh for us to help these uh people who doesn't 
have background to entrepreneurship so that they can use entrepreneurship as a tool to uh, cope up with the situation. That's a great point, Aubrey. So our Q and A's are, are blowing up, they're exploding. So that being said, I am so grateful for the lively and authentic and vulnerable conversations that we just had. I'm sure it's, it's given life to a lot of people. So uh, I'm appreciative of that. And Christine, can I throw it to you so that you can ask uh, some of the questions to us? Of course. So let's get right into it. Again, to reiterate Amos, wonderful introduction, by the way. I think you took everyone back to the, back to the church with that intro. It was amazing. So thank you, Amos, for moderating that panel. Another round of applause, virtual claps, and the comments. Like he said, the chat fee is on fire. So let's start with the first question. Uh, Rabbi Hamido asks, majority of young people may not have a sense of purpose. How do we solve this issue? Which is a very loaded question to kick off. Let's see who could take off. <laughs> it's a billion dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> it's a billion dollar question. I can jump in first and then I'll release it. Um, purpose is not something that you find. Purpose is something that is revealed. It is a revelation. And the way that you receive revelations is by being restful and being quiet. And in those moments of turmoil, uh, it's an inner voice that you know that gives you complete um, and utter uh, um, feeling of approval. And that small voice says, this is how you bring sustainable change to the masses. So it's, it's listening to that voice and then making the conscious decision to put one small step in front of the other and purpose is revealed. It is never discovered. Yeah, I would, I would definitely second that because as someone who struggled to find their purpose for a long time, my first degree was in graphic design. Then I went back for early childhood education. I'm currently in for uh, urban Christian ministry. So eventually it took me a while to realize that I am um, purpose for ministry, right? Yeah. So it's like you said, you don't find your purpose, it finds you. Once you realize this is what I want to do and this is what makes me happy, then you realize, okay, this is it. And like you said, resting, taking that time. I personally, um, and I feel comfortable saying that in this space, that, you know, I will fast. And yeah. when I would fast and seek answers, I would get answers. And so taking yourself aside, getting rid of all the distractions and realizing what really makes you happy, that's when the purpose finds you. Yeah. I would only agree. I would personally envision um, purpose not to be something on the far horizon to go to, but rather um, I would advise to just go to the horizon and find a purpose along the way. I think the, tr the journey is more important than the destination itself, which may be a purpose. However, during our journey, um, we can, of course, still be led by, 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 by positive uh, influences from the people that are close and dear to us. And um, this also includes, of course, our interrelation with the rest of the world and the things that are needed by other people. So I think on our life's journey, uh, we will find a purpose um, by being influenced by other people sometimes, but also by our own um, inner being. Amazing responses to that first question. Don't worry, we have way more to come. And so let's transition to Derek and let's keep filling the questions from the social media feed. We'd love to answer those as well. So this one's from Derek. This discussion is so important. However, the challenge with young people in engaging into entrepreneurship, for example, is that there is need of startup money for business. How best can we train young people in business that do not require so much funding so that they can be able to bring their best foot forward? Great question. Um, you know, as a person who's launched four businesses, uh, two of them with zero outside funding and capital, I think it goes back to the body conversation again. Your arm it isn't as more important as your leg. Um, and that means that there are people in your network that have certain skill sets that you can ask for help. And, and, and I think that is, especially for men, that's by far the most vulnerable place that we can be is to say, I don't have the answers, but this is the vision. And as an entrepreneur, your responsibility is to ensure that the seed that was planted in your heart has the ability 
to be communicated to someone else where they can reflect that tree that's growing. Um, so it is, uh, it's not impossible. It does require us to pay attention and it does require us to be really humble, um, yet also resilient in receiving no's because it will happen. One more person want to take that from the panel? Well, and you also have to understand uh, that you, those times that we're living right now, you, you can actually talk to, I don't know, whoever you want in like two, two or three social network connections, right? So you can, even if you don't have fu the, the funding for it, you don't have the money to start a business or to do something, you can uh, talk, as Amos was saying, you can connect people around you or even connect people that you don't even know next to you. They're not, not near to uh, you. You can post something on Facebook and tag, I don't know, whoever you want, right? Obama, if you will, you know, and, and you, can, you can have the connection that you need. So that's one of the greatest time we're leaving uh, to start a business because of that. So it's easy to find the connections you need to start a business. All right, let's transition to the next question from John Ray Luciano. How can we ensure, especially this being the future of work panel, you guys had different insights and Arbor, you might be able to lead on this. How can we ensure that working conditions will be safe for workers in the mm. midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Another loaded question from John Ray. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, no problems. How can we ensure that working conditions will be safe for workers in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, so here we practice the 50% of uh, people working uh, should be like uh, scheduling inside the work. But for us entrepreneurs, we also practice this um, safety measure or guidelines not to contact with people like directly. So you have the scheduling of how you deliver your goods and you communicate with them um, digitally so that you know when and where to pick your um, example, your items, what the, you're selling. Anyone else want to take that question? Yeah, here in um, Charlotte, they've actually done a really good job with the why, um, sending out COVID-19 um, guidelines to where we are all aware of what the rules are, of what the conditions will be. And one of the biggest things that I appreciated about the work that they put in was reminding us that if we don't have to put ourselves in unnecessary, you know, physical um, proximity, don't. So, and it was really just kind of freeing us and reminding us that our health is, is a big concern to them um, and remembering to just stay safe in whatever condition. So having a uniform message to the whole wines association, I think that's what was um, helpful. All right, final question before we transition to the encouragement video. What final remarks do you have regarding what the future will look like in terms of work? Are you scared? Are you hopeful? Um, the future of work is the future of now. Um, I am very hopeful and very happy. I'm hopeful too, but uh, I am a bit scared because uh, people have to understand and they, they, they may didn't understand yet that change will, will need you need to change, and, and that's good. That's what makes us hopeful. <laughs> All right, so you guys heard it here first. Can we get another round of virtual applause for the second panel of the conference, Future of Work, moderated by the infamous Amos Winbush, where our four amazing panelists, Aubrey, Raquel, Cristiano, thank you so much for your feedback on this panel. Let's get another virtual round of applause, such a pertinent conversation, such insightful messages. And now we're gonna transition to our encouragement video from Hazami and Be The One music video. Let's tune into this one, everyone. I just want to say thank you to the YMCA for inviting us to be part of this exciting initiative. The Youth Voices 
and the future we want is the dialogue that we need to be having as a world right now. My name is Hazami Bermada, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Humanity Lab Foundation. And we have just launched a very exciting global campaign, and we invite you to join us and be the one. And I'm going to tee it over to our very inspiring brand ambassadors, international award-winning singers and performers who are the heart and soul of the campaign itself. So with that, I'm going to tee it over to you, Isa. Hi. Hi, Hasemi. How are you? Um, I'm so glad to be part of this. I'm so glad to be part of this beautiful campaign. What a beautiful work and, and how, necessary, how necessary it is to show and to share this with the world. Um, talking about this amazing campaign, be the one, um, I'm sure that we all want to see the world change and but we want it but wanting to see is not enough we have to act uh the world needs us and we have to think um how can we change as human beings i think the first step should to should be to come look at yourself and do a self-analysis and understand what you can change how can you be a better person for the world for those around you uh the video and that care can help you to find your inner light. And now I wanna call our amazing partner and artist, Major. Yo, yo, hello. I'm really excited about this campaign. Um, I'm really excited about this song and that to find out that it's connected with the YMCA is amazing for me because when I was a kid, I was living in Detroit and I would go to the YMCA. That was the only place I could play basketball. There was no courts open. Some of them were like, really bad sh like streets so the court wasn't in good shape but it was glass so the YMCA was a place you could go in and and you know get a chance to play so I remember a lot of good moments in the YMCA I used to want to go to the YMCA all the time go to the gym so I'm really grateful that we're connected and for all the you know young people who are in the YMCA right now you know uh, it's super cool you, you can you can go on to do anything you want there's no limit you can go any do anything you want and i think that's exciting it's exciting about the time and i just want to uh say thank you to everyone who's a part of this and uh just send a lot of love and blessings to everyone out there we invite you to join us we'd love to partner with each and every single one of you and look at the opportunities that we can create together on behalf of all of us whoop, whoop. All right, hopefully you guys are feeling the energy and the love from that video, and so a huge thank you. And now let's transition to our third panel of the day. We're gonna jump right into this climate justice, moderated by Alexandria, founder and executive director of Earth Uprising. Over to you, let's give her a virtual round of applause as she kicks off the third and amazing panel. Yes, so thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here today. So hi everyone, I'm Alexandra Villasenor. I am a 15 year old climate activist from New York City. Um, I'm a Fridays for Future organizer and the founder of Earth Uprising International, a climate education organization. In this past year, the world has seen an uprising of youth activism surrounding climate action and social justice. However, this activism is not new. Youth have been leading the way for change since the early 19th century when children were workers, and then through the social and cultural changes in the 1950s and 60s, all the way through to today with amazing global leaders such as Malala and the Parkland students. Youth activism is even more important now with our futures increasingly being fraught with peril. Our generation will be affected the most by global issues like climate change, rising political instability, and economic inequality. Youth are taking responsibility for our futures and leading the way for the change that needs to be made. So today we have an exciting panel for you with four amazing youth leaders from around the world to discuss youth activism. So I'm going to pass it over and let them introduce themselves. Please correct me if I pronounce anything wrong. Um, so how about we start with Miali, to introduce yourself. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I am Miali Sumiana from Madagascar YMCA. Um, I've been volunteering at the YMCA since 2016 and uh, I am very happy to be here to talk um, with you guys and see you. Awesome, how about we pass it over to Alvin? 
大家好 ，Hello， I'm Alvin Tan from Hong Kong. I'm a town planner by profession, and a volunteer at the YMCA. I'm very happy to be here to discuss with you the future we want, climate and resiliency, and especially, very importantly, health and the city at this time with COVID-19. Thank you. Awesome, so okay. Hello, all together. My name is Lilke. I'm a student in global change management, and I'm a volunteer in the YMCA, and a member in the YMCA's resource group on environment together with Alvin and Excel. And I'm also a co-leader in the working group of climate education. Thank you for having me. And Jael. Hi, my name is Jael Ishev. You can call me Excel. Uh, I'm from Mexico City and uh, I have been part of the YMCA as a volunteer for more than 20 years now. Uh, I have been co-leading along with Silke here, the Climate Education Working Group of the RGE from the World YMCA. I'm so happy to be part of this panel along with this amazing group of young people here, including you, Alexandria. And I'm willing to answer all of your questions. Um, thanks to the World YMCA for the opportunity and who uh, I hope you all uh, enjoy the panel. Thanks. Great. So I was thinking we jump right into this discussion. And um, Jail, let's start with you. Uh, one thing, one aspect in the climate movement that is very important is social justice. And I believe that you cannot get climate action without focusing on equity. So in your perspective, and considering your background working on gender mainstreaming on climate related projects, I would love to hear a little more about your work. And do you think the COVID pandemic has a gender gap? Well, um, thanks. Yes, I have been working on mainstreaming gender perspective into climate related projects like uh, the red mechanism in Mexico and some other like the national strategy on biodiversity. And well, just as the climate crisis, and I'm gonna say, yes, this pandemic definitely has a gender um, gap, but let's try to understand why. Um, it's not that the coronavirus can discriminate estrogen from progesterone and decide somehow to affect more one sex to the other. That not make any sense. But according to the most recent available data, men seem to represent the majority of coronavirus deaths worldwide. Even though globally, uh, men and women contract the virus in rel relatively um, equal numbers. So let's see why one, this is one gender gap, the disparities, evident disparities between male and female deaths. Still not knowing uh, exactly why, there are some hypotheses include that men are more likely to practice unhealthy habits, including smoking and drinking, for example. Also, I, I read in some place that men are less likely to wash their hands and less, less likely to use soap. Um, also, men could also be more prone to underlying health problems that affect them more more in this pandemic and some other issues related to habits and social norms. So we have this gender gap affecting more men than women. But let's see in the other side, um, pandemics are putting, this pandemic is putting on evidence the inequalities faced by women and girls. Which ones, for example, women are disproportionately uh, affected by poverty worldwide. So the job losses and the economic contraction is going to affect them the most. Women also are more likely to assume the greatest burden of care during the lockdown period. For example, childcare or elder care um, at homes or even in residential facilities, hospital care for infected patients. Um, I mean, most of care and domestic unpaid, by the way, work relies on women. Um, it's maybe the group that will be most affected by the loss of informal jobs, uh, informal employment, like house cleaners, career, carers, et, et cetera. Um, there's evidence that women are being most affected by the lack of access to safe family planning methods um, 
sadly are being more affected by domestic violence. And the list can go on and on. So definitely the measures to combat the coronavirus and the recovery plans should be, must be gender responsive. Otherwise, um, they will exacerbate the existing inequalities. Yeah, great points. I think that I agree with that 100%. One thing that the United Nations, Jai Athma, who's just on here, talks about a lot is one of the best ways to combat the climate crisis is by educating women. So that is all great points. And turning over to you now, Silke, right now there are a lot of communities who don't have the resources they need to properly We lost your sound there, Alexandra. And we have time for like two more questions. Go ahead. Um, maybe I can answer them in the interim time to let yeah, Alexandra find the voice back. Um, and in case you can speak again, you can also um, fulfill like the question and the question. Um, I had a lot of thoughts when I was thinking about how to prepare this webinar and I thought like I could talk about the webinar that we that we have in our own group like we have our own webinar series about climate negotiations in our working group on climate education that um, I'm coding with Excel together and also there's a campaign introduced by members of YMCA on sustainable food at negotiations. Um, but I chose to speak about uh, corona related topics since it's really timely. And since I'm from Germany and I'm a member and secretary in the working group on international cooperation in Northern Germany, we are launching a campaign today on global solidarity on the topic of Corona. Because in a lot of countries, um, people are really hardly affected by Corona effects like losing their jobs or not being able to go outside of the home because then there might be risk of getting infected. So there are a lot of projects um, fulfilled by YMCA's across the world to help affected communities. And uh, in our YMCA, Northern Germany, we're launching this campaign to help those people that are affected by the crisis. It's a social media campaign. And um, if you want to know more about that, you can always text me. And um, the thing works like you get nominated by a friend, for example, and you're invited to cook a recipe with five ingredients of your choice. And since the message is you have a recipe, you have a nice meal that you can post in your status, for example, in WhatsApp or other social media. And you will also share that meal with another person in the global YMCA world um, by donating a few euros or dollars or depending on your region. And uh, the YMCA has prepared wonderful campaign sites, uh, like for the German case, I know the German webpage, YMCA Germany has a campaign call on its webpage, but also okay. the World YMCA has prepared some webpage on that where you can find more information, also donation webpages, and it would Thank be cool so if you could that. engage in that campaign. All right. For interest of time, we're going to pass it back to Alexander because we do have about four minutes for you to um, still answer questions before we open it to Q&A. So passing it back to you, Alexandria. Awesome. Um, so moving on to Alvin, uh, I had a question for you. So cities and urban areas are more densely populated and are at greater risk for climate fuel disasters. So given your work in this area, can you tell us about how cities can become low carbon and urban areas can become more resilient to climate change? Mm, that's quite a big topic, but I would like to talk about one of the examples that I think of um, how we can deal with COVID-19 or some public health emergency. At the same time, we are doing low carbon cities. So in urban design, we try to design cities that is pedestrians and bicycle friendly. So that can actually enhance our city livability and also improve the quality of our public health because we can walk to a place or cycle to a place easier. And that means that we can have better accessibility to sports and recreational facilities. So this can help to increase our physical fitness, cardio respiratory fitness, and also muscular strength. And at the same time, I think this can reduce our syndrome for depression. So 
we can at the same time um, fighting for uh, climate change. Uh, also at the same time, we're fighting for COVID-19 in a more environmental friendly way. I like that. Our next question. Before yeah, I sorry, to question. My, my internet isn't that stable right now. So, um, so the last question before we pass it over, um, Miali, I was when we were talking in the chat, you mentioned how one of your clubs you were doing a lot at YMCA, working with young people and raising awareness, which I think is amazing. But you also talked about how it's changed to online now during the pandemic. So. How has everything at YMCA changed around that, especially since quarantine? And how are you still striving for change? Okay, um, thank you very much, Alexandria. So here at the Madagascar YMCA, we are working through different clubs and where young people are gathering and doing activities. So one of these clubs is called Y Urban Clubs. Um, they are doing promoting recycling to try to reduce plastic waste and uh, fight against climate change so normally they are going they are reaching schools and the local communities for that and now that we are in lockdowns um, for two months now um, it was quite um, a big issue for us so we began to work online from home and um, as we know like most of the people are spending their time online on social media. We trying to make, raise awareness on social media um, about how can we um, get preventive action on COVID-19 COVID with uh, considering the climate change, for example, to use renewable masks. Um, the issue is that like people, not everybody are on, um, at internet, has internet access uh, in here in Madagascar. And it's um, a big issue that increased the gap between different society, society layers. So um, our, our, my thought is that we have to try to think about those marginalized people uh, as in Madagascar, like vulnerable marginalized people are the ones that cause the most environmental um, deterioration through, for example, charcoal production, um, as uh, more than 80% of Malagasy people whole world are using charcoal, in, for example. So these are different kinds of um, situation here in Madagascar, but at the same time, as I am saying that um, the carbon footprint of the was like um, actually people are making digital cleanup day, digital campaign as everybody are moving to using internet, and then here I have some statistics that the carbon, carbon footprint of the internet and the systems supporting it account about 3.7% of global greenhouse emissions, which is similar to the amounts produced globally by the airline industry. And um, some studies estimate that in a decade, the internet network will produce 20% produce of the world's greenhouse gases. So these are um, kind of contrasted between different um, climate justice campaign in um, uh, in over the world and in Madagascar as well. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. So we will now be going over to a and a So I will pass it over to you, Christine. All right, and before we pass it off to questions, can we please get a round of applause for Alexandria for moderating this conversation? And just to make sure you guys are aware who she is, she's one of the youngest activists. I know a lot of people know about Greta, but she's a New Yorker that kicked off this movement for the youth. So, you know, as a New Yorker, I gotta represent the love. Can we give a virtual round of applause for Alexandria for moderating this conversation? Because climate change is a problem. Climate change is something that we can change in our generation. It's amazing to see 
all of you, Alvin, Seathgate, Mayai, all having commentary on this. It was amazing to hear you. Thank you so much for your insights. So now let's jump into Q&A. We got a lot of Q&A coming in on this. First one coming in from John Ray Luciano. How can we ensure that climate action initiatives will be sustainable and attainable even for developing countries? Who wants to take this one? I guess I'll pass it to probably Alexandria and you are moderating the conversation. So let's see if you could give your first response on this question. Yeah, of course. So in Earth Uprising, I've gotten to work with a lot of people all around the world. And one thing we're starting to focus a lot on, especially in 2020, is how to have young people in the decision-making area and in the solutions. So I was actually at COP25 in Madrid and so it was amazing to see young people finally able to be in these rooms with all of our politicians. And for a lot of young people, it was our first ever COP, of course, and the first time we were able to be there. And so we saw a lot how um, everything worked and we realized just how much young people have to be firsthand when it comes to legislation and decision making. Because a lot of the time, our politicians only think about what is politically possible and they usually some countries at the negotiations at COP especially were blocking the negotiations. So young people have to be there putting pressure for certain legislation. And so I think that it's important for young people, especially in those countries, to have a voice in what is happening in their political system because they know what's happening there first and foremost and what needs to happen. And so I think that one way to make sure that legislation is sustainable is with having young people there first and foremost. Amazing. Did anyone else want to jump in on this? Axel or Alvin or Silky? Alvin, you want to jump in? Yeah, I try to take this question. I think for young people, not just in developing countries, but everyone, all the young people, or including um, YMCA or youth organizations, we can try to foster cooperations across different sectors because climate change is really a big issue that uh, no, not even one single person can do with it. So we need um, all the involvement so that we can build a really um, climate resilient communities. And I think for the future, young people's want, we want to see a future that is, uh, we have resilient um, community that can effectively respond to climate and also for public health emergency. It is very important. And going into the next question here, how can we engage all sectors of society into motion to pursue climate change or climate action through programs and initiatives? And many of you are climate activists, so what have you, in a sense, been doing to drive this common purpose here? We could hear from uh, Axel, Marai, or Silke. You would like to take that question? Or you yeah, you you, can go no, you go ahead, Silke. Okay. Then maybe you can add later on. Um, I think it's just really important that all sectors take action on climate action. And every sector has a right and has its necessity to do that. It's not only one sector that, that has the, the most impact or anything, but it's all important that we do it all together. And um, people can be engaged in different sectors. Some, we said earlier, you need to find, or the purpose needs to find you, right? And uh, once the purpose found you and you have, you, you are aware of your talent, you should use your talent and make it um, be fruitful for climate action. Some maybe can paint wonderfully, some others have a loud voice, some others are good in writing text, so you should really use your talent and um, use that gift that was given to you for climate action, I think. And that can happen in different sectors, of course. I pass it to Ixel. Yes, thank you. I totally agree with you, Silke. And I'm thinking that we must be responsible. All sectors must be responsible in, in their own um, way. Uh, we, we should act in a preventive basis, not just react to the circumstances, because we are seeing now how the economic um, system is almost collapsing uh, because we are changing our habits of consumption and production. So, this puts us in the opportunity to build a new normality and this new normality uh, will make uh, different sectors to play their roles differently. 
So we can um, we can have we now have the opportunity to raise a low uh, carbon economy. We can actually achieve uh, a sustainable development and different sectors, all sectors uh, play a different role, but we all must uh, seek the same goal that is sustainable development. This is actually an opportunity and not, not a crisis, I guess. And final question here before we transition to the next panel. And I think this will be coming for me personally, because this is such a dynamic panel. I'd like to ask you guys that you guys really just informed us about climate change. I want you to inspire us because there's a lot of young people on this session that want to be inspired about the actions you took to activate people around the world on the issue of climate change. Tell us really briefly in 60 seconds, what happened the night before you took action before you became a climate activist. How can people be inspired by the first action you took to be in this position to inspire all of us on this call today? All of you, please give us a 60 second response. Who wants to go first? Sure, I can start. So the first ever action I took was going on climate strike on December 14th of 2018. And that started my activism. And that's how I felt like I could take in action and make my voice heard. So the night before I did that, what I was doing is I was making a sign thinking that, what am I doing? I've never been to a protest before, but I went out there and I did it. And it was probably the best decision of my life. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. The night before, who's next? Okay, so, uh, so maybe instead of answering question that about my long history, I would like to talk about one thing that I did recently. So I will try to link uh, climate change or environments together with fighting uh, COVID-19 together. How can we fight COVID-19 in a more environmental friendly way? So I was a bit worried considering the amount of bleach, detergents and sanitizer we used in Hong Kong. So I was uh, going around to ask people saying that actually, we, can, we don't need to use so much bleach. We can just use water to put into the U-trap drainage in Hong Kong or in the building so that they can serve the same purpose. And the second actions I did is rather than giving out some one-off um, face mask, we tried to use some reusable masks. So I joined with some friends to make some reusable masks. So this is one of them that can be used for more than uh, 60 times. So that is one of the way that we can fight two things at the same time. All right, couple seconds left. Axel? Well, well, I have to say that I actually do not remember exactly what I was doing then before. Uh, I'm not even sure what was my first um, activism uh, activity on climate change, but I, I can say that it's because it's somehow it's developing with you and while you're um, growing as a person and as a professional, suddenly you're in the middle of a climate negotiation uh, making youth voices heard. So doesn't need to be something as planned as, a, as a, tomorrow I'm going to do this and this and this. Maybe it's not a checklist. Maybe it's just uh, going with your passions, going with your um, thoughts and just do it. It happens anyway. <laughs> Couple seconds left. Okay. Let, okay. So yeah. So um, while I, I I can't remember as well, but what I am thinking is like when I was seeing all around of me that people are just littering everywhere. I was thinking, okay, if it's not me, who will tell these people? Who will engage them of doing the right thing? So if I will always um, just see what is happening and not act, not tell, not speak. So who will do that? Who will still live in this even 100 years later? So that is why I was thinking like, I have to do it. If not me, then who? Amazing. Sisley, you have the final word. Okay, I will take that. I think for me, it was not one night of discovering that I need to take action, but it was more like a slow process. Like I learned about climate change at an age of 14 or something, I think. That was like some years back. and. Um, I think for me it was crucial to to really realize that I have skills that I can use for climate action and also 
have a mindset of not caring what others might think about that because I have my own opinion and I want to do what I need to do in my opinion. So I think that's the basic message to really do what you're convinced about to do. Amazing. Guys, another round of virtual applause to our panelists for climate change. Definitely inspiring and insightful. Another round of applause. And as we get excited to get and soak in the feedback, it was a lot of content that was shared. Hopefully it inspires you to take action that this is a pertinent problem of our age and our generation will be the generation that all generations remember made the stand, made the change, and actually made it happen. So again, another round of applause for our third panel. And before we transition to the last panel of the day, let's hear from this encouragement video from Katja Averson from Women Deliver and Richard Elderman. Stay tuned. Hello, YMCA members, staff, volunteers, hello, young people from across the globe. My name is Katja Iverson and I'm the President and CEO of Women Deliver, a global advocacy organization that works for gender equality and the health and rights of girls and women. As the world adapts to these difficult COVID times, there's a lot of people working together to prepare, to respond, but also to use the opportunity to build a better future for all. And you have a very special role to play. Whatever it is you're passionate about, whatever change it is that you want to see, my message to you is dream it, do it, speak up and stand up. We need your voice, ideas and innovation, not least to create a gender equal future where everybody, no matter where they are born or in which body, can live their full potential and not be held back by old gender norms or by social and economic structures and barriers. We want a gender equal world because we know, and evidence shows, that a gender equal world is healthier, wealthier, more productive, and more peaceful. So enjoy this virtual conference and then use your power, use your voice to get us all to that gender equal future. I and Women Deliver, we're with you. Hi, I'm Richard Edelman. Uh, I run the uh, PR company Edelman. We're co-headquartered in Chicago and New York. I'm so proud of what the YMCA is doing to magnify the voices of youth. In fact, we've just done an Edelman Trust Barometer across 12 countries and found that two thirds of people are optimistic about what's gonna happen as a result of COVID. More family, more at home, more values, less selling and more solutions. And the YMCA is a critical partner in magnifying the voices of youth because you carry our future. Thank you for all of you do and we're behind you. Wow. I'm hoping you guys are feeling the chills because we've been receiving a lot of empowering videos throughout the day. And now I'm pleased and so excited to welcome you guys to the last panel and probably one of the culminating topics that I'm sure many of you want to walk away with. Title, Youth Resiliency and Emerging Future panel. I am so pleased to welcome our final moderator of the day, William Smith Stubbs, the co-founder of Spur. Let's give him a warm welcome, virtual claps, to kick off the final, final panel and amazing topic of the day, Youth Resiliency and the Emerging Future panel. Over to you, William, welcome. Thank you very much. It, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And what an amazing uh, line of the panels. It's, it's always a bit of a pressure to be the last panel to go, but I'm, I've no doubt we're going to uh, bring it to, uh, to this last one. Um, you know, at the end of last year, I did something that I never thought I was going to do. Uh, I bought an engagement ring and I was, I was so excited uh, to do that. And I was thinking about it for months and I, and I obviously couldn't tell my best friend who I was proposing to. And uh, in January, we were at um, a lake in Switzerland and I asked her if she wanted to marry me. Fortunately, she said yes. Uh, um, and I was so excited and, and I've never been so excited for my future and to build a future with somebody. But underneath all that, I am concerned. I'm afraid for our future and for our children's future and, and what their lives will be like. And I think as Alexandria very eloquently um, outlined, 
So there are a range of challenges that are facing us from uh, political polarization, rising inequality within countries to a planet that is drastically faced by climate change issues. My country um, for the past uh, four months, at the beginning of the year was literally on fire. Uh, and we thought, well, that, that was difficult, but we'll get through that. 2020, not been so great so far. Um, and it's been very concerning as somebody who is looking to the future to think what sort of future will that be? Um, and yet, wherever I've been in the world, whenever I feel like it is purely dark days ahead of us, that there is no real hope or, or light on the horizon, it is always talking to young people that makes me feel like things are going to be okay. Um, anywhere in the world, you find young people working on innovative solutions, uh, creative ideas, who are working together collaboratively to uplift other people, to bring along everybody into a future that is better for all of us, more equal, more just, uh, more sustainable. And so the people on the panel today um, is partially therapy for me, I think, to talk to them um, and to feel better about the future. And I'm delighted to run this panel. Um, and so I'd love our panelists to uh, switch their cameras on and um, introduce themselves. I might start with uh, Kiran, if, if you could be as kind to uh, say hello. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kieran Coach McCabe. I'm a rising sophomore at American University in Washington, DC. That's also where I'm based. Uh, in terms of my involvement with the YMCA, I participated in our youth and government program um, in the state of Maryland, um, and also on a national level at our national conference. Um, international development uh, and youth engagement are issues that I hold very close to my heart. Um, I've been involved with the International Development Organization CARE since I was seven through their annual advocacy conference, and I'm one of their Maryland State Advocacy Chairs, and I was also the chairperson of my city's youth council for its first two years in existence. So I'm really looking forward to um, what we'll be discussing this panel, and I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists. Lovely. Thank you, Kiran. Um, Reginald. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, William. I, I bring your greetings from Accra, Ghana. My name is Reginald uh, Foscra. I work for the Ghana YMC as the director in charge of some eight local YMCAs in Ghana's capital administrative region. I've been involved with the YMCA for the past 30 years uh, with a volunteer experience since the age of 10. And I'm happy to engage you all. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, Anna. Hello, my name is Anna Clara and I'm from Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay in South America. Um, in the last years, I have worked a lot on issues related to youth, governance and 2030 agenda. I am a member of the Board of Directors of the YMCA of Montevideo in Uruguay, a member of the United Nations Advocacy Group of the World YMCA, and I also coordinate the Youth Network on 2030 Agenda in the LACA area. I am very, I'm very happy to be here and to be able to talk to all of you. Thank you very much. And lucky last, Mike. Thanks, William. Um, hi, I'm Mike Bromfield. Uh, I'm based in the UK, about an hour outside of London. Um, I'm a YMCA volunteer and uh, vice chair of my local YMCA here in Essex, uh, but I'm also uh, the managing director of Bromfield Events, which aims to work with organisations exactly like YMCA that aim to make a difference through social impact or cause driven events, just like this one. Uh, and, and more recently on YMCA Europe's 175th anniversary celebrations for uh, YMCA globally. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for your time to be here today. Um, I mentioned this to, to DJ ahead of this, that I don't know your ages exactly, but I know I'm older than you and you're way ahead of where I was when I was your age. And so that immediately makes me feel uh, immensely hopeful for the future. Um, and, and speaking of which, this, this whole event is, is a great response to a crisis that we're all going through now. Um, that is very uncertain. We are in a liminal stage where we're not pre-COVID, we're not yet post-COVID. It is very hard to predict what is going to happen. One thing that is quite clear, though, is that youth are going to be disproportionately affected by this crisis, both uh, in terms of economic prospects as well as uh, social disruption. And I'd love to ask uh, Anna, ahead of this conversation, you had some really great thoughts and quite clear passion about 
our need to focus on youth in rebuilding uh, after COVID. I wonder if you have any um, guidance on what youth should be doing, or perhaps those who support youth to ensure that they build the resilience and can build a future that they want after this pandemic is passed. Oh, thank you, Will. Uh, in my case, I can talk about the reality of young people in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it is a region that before this crisis already had high levels of inequality, uh, many of, of which especially affected young people, such as health or education or employment. And that is why I consider that we are facing this crisis from a weaker position than other regions of the world. And many of the responses that government have found as distance education or employment flexibility directly affect young people, and in particular those young people who were already in a vulnerable situation. And that is one of the most complicated problems from my point of, of view. Inequality in places where there was already inequality. And personally, I think that one of the words that most describes the, the future is uncertainty. And this doesn't escape the reality of, of young people, of course. But I feel that as a young people, we are a population that is especially resilient. And I think that today, more than ever, in many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, young people are mobilizing and generating networks of collaboration. So I believe that as an organization, we are challenged to provide certainty. And we can do that by strengthening our networks of collaboration, both internal and external. And I think that here, SDG 17, Partnership for the Goals, is going to be essential and should be a priority for the strategic vision of, of the organization, and also an opportunity to revise our strategy and to empower the voice of young people in this process. Fantastic, thank you very much. And I have some questions I might come back to if we have time around that certainty issue, which I think is a really, really key point in empowering anybody, uh, particularly in youth. Um, but it does raise some, some questions, particularly around resilience, in that many of you are young leaders or emerging leaders who are already doing so much, as I said, way more than I was doing when I was um, your age. Um, Reginald, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. I know that from your background, you've been in a leadership position for more than a decade. Uh, you, from what I've seen, have a lot on your plate and no doubt during the crisis that, that is unfolding now for your community, even more, and perhaps that plate is overflowing. What advice do you have for young leaders to manage their own well-being in order to provide for others? And as Anna said, to be able to provide certainty for your community, you have to be able to be functional as well. Any advice around that? Thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, I, I mean, in response to this question, I have to be sincere. I mean, um, I, I won't volunteer this uh, extent of sincerity on a platform like this, but I think it's essential, especially for our audience. You know, I, I am on record to have pursued significant actions under pressure. Uh, and often I get to hurt the feelings of uh, some young people. I, I've had to work with, you know, unfortunately. But I, through feedback, useful ones, of course, I've had uh, the opportunity to read a lot more about what can make me a better leader. Like you earlier said, I've had opportunity to serve young people and to serve myself uh, in leadership over the period. And I, I feel that it is important that we respect feedback because you hardly you hardly can tell you know what impact you are making whilst you journey to your you know desired uh, destination i i mean you have one 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 of the embedded difficulties with leadership has to do with pressure you know, and um, you you need some experience, depending on depending on your temperament. You know, to engage people under pressure. You know, and and I I have a new formation, and with this opportunity, I'll tell all young people that look, anytime you get feedback, say thank you. Don't explain away because it won't do you any good. When you have an opportunity to engage young people, 
the best that can make you better is feedback. <laughs> because there are things that come with leadership. And uh, of course, you will have to create that opportunity to control yourself. And the ability to control yourself requires that you build that internal capacity to cope with any form of pressure, you know, by navigating whatever issues from negative to positive, from stress to coping with those issues, and even giving assurances, even when there is panic. I mean, because you can never manage others in same situation if you're unable to manage yourself. And as much as possible, try to keep up with the purpose for which you feel the drive to engage your mission. And I think um, with all the others, sometimes we are overwhelmed with expectations. I mean, the saying goes that to whom much is given, much is expected. And if you know you're giving much, of course, there will be that a bunch of weight on you to deliver. And that, of course, also sets you up to give in to things that ordinarily you would not have to. So I think above all, we will have to keep ourselves measured and be tolerant to views that come our way that intentionally or unintentionally are meant to make our leadership better. Brilliant. Very, very wise words. Um, and it reflects some of the best advice I ever got, which was feedback is love. If anybody is telling you uh, something that you might not want to hear, it's probably because they care. Um, taking it is another, another yeah. challenge I'm still working on. Um, so Mike, um, I, I, I note that a lot of your work is in many ways at bringing people together. Um, your, your events work, your communication, it's about allowing people a, a way to convene to collaborate and to tackle big problems that can only be tackled by groups. Bit tricky now. Um, and we're in a world where it's harder and harder to get together. And I wonder if, if um, you have any, any predictions or ideas about what does the future of that look like? How do the youth of today in leadership positions or in activism, advocacy, how do we come together when we can't necessarily see each other face to face? How do we build those sense of trust? I think, that's a that's a big question because you know one of the first things that happened for me in the industry that i work is that a hundred percent of my income went overnight uh because people aren't coming together through physical events i'm i'm in a fortunate position where i'm prepared at least for now and through state support to to be able to continue to bring people together in other ways that's why i've you know actually one of the first things i did uh, when the pandemic set in and it became apparent the magnitude was to say, how can I help? I reached out to local organizations to volunteer, international NGOs like World YMCA to say, is there any way that I can in some way increase your capacity to respond, to help with your transparency and your communications, to virtually bring people together? But I you know, that, that isn't necessarily going to be that way for everybody. Uh, not everyone's going to be in that position where they've got, got those networks. <clears throat> and actually, I think at the moment, uh, it's the same rules that apply in this virtual world that applied in the physical world. Don't wait to be asked for a seat at the table. Um, you know, get yourself a seat at the table, take that seat at the table um, and take other people with you wherever you can. Um, that's been a great reoccurring theme I've noticed in all the panels about sharing and taking people on that journey with you, um, about breaking down the barriers of inequality, um, being mindful of diversity and, and, and inclusion, not just mindful, but actually having that as a fundamental part of what you are trying to do. And you should always do it with humility and respect, um, because otherwise you can't earn that trust. Uh, you know, the, to come back to your point about the connections we make, the connection we're making right now can only be done if there is a level of trust and understanding between us that you will ask me a question that I am able to answer and I will give you the answer that you hope will help the audience. Um, and I, I think if you just apply those principles throughout all of the work that you do as a young leader um, and 
you you will find yourself very quickly being able to make more connections than you ever thought possible. Well, my trust given and trust earned, that was a brilliant answer, um, as I expected. And a masterful segue into uh, a question I have for Karan. Um, your work, you recently went through a program around um, governments and your studies in international development and, and um, policy. As Alexandra and the panel earlier pointed out, youth have a, a vital role in shaping policy for the future. Um, most of the decisions that are made now are by people who won't be around to see the effects of that. It is this generation that will live with those decisions. How do we encourage youth to get more involved in policy making? How do we how do we create that seat at the table for those who otherwise are relegated to the child's table at the other end of the hall? Karan, any advice on, on how to encourage youth to get more active in government and policy? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a really great question to ask in this situation um, when we are finding that there is a lot of time on our hands, possibly, um, to really engage with people and to explore our passions um, and to um, to take action on issues that we see are popping up in our communities. Um, and I think the YMCA actually has some incredible opportunities um, and has some incredible programs in place to engage young people. Um, in the United States, actually, we have, uh, we're launching this national um, summer program um, for high school students. It's called the Changemakers Institute. Um, and it basically helps to teach um, young people um, the skills that they need to help develop um, advocacy um, to help create those networking connections um, so that they are in a better place to be able to then advocate for those issues in the future. Um, and I think that's incredibly important also because it's such a great example of the need to invest in our youth now more than ever. Um, and and I, th I think that's uh, really an incredible um, opportunity for them. I think other things are, um, there's so many different um, youth activism organizations that are continuing to engage their supporters um, through whatever way possible. There are, um, as Alexandria had pointed out, she's part of Fridays for the Future. Um, they've been doing virtual strikes um, on Twitter, on different social media to still get their message out there. Um, and, and so I think that's a great example. Um, there is an organization called Vote 16 USA that is um, aiming to help lower the voting age to 16. Um, my city of Tacoma Park actually has already lowered the voting age to 16. Um, and uh, we've seen in San Francisco, there's been um, a great movement to getting um, the uh, charter change on the ballot in November, which is incredible. Um, we see that's a lot of US based um, topics, but we see there's a campaign that's been launched called Justice for Every Child. Um, it's a campaign of this other campaign called the 100 million campaign, which is a youth globalization um, movement basically uh, to encourage youth to speak up on behalf of youth. And so Justice for Every Child campaign was recently launched, basically asking um, the world's governments to really step up and to support youth um, through this crisis. So I think we've, we're seeing a lot of incredible opportunities um, that maybe just need to be put in front of youth a little more. Um, but I definitely think that there is so much out there to help engage youth um, and, and Speaking from personal experience, I know that given those opportunities, I would be able to act on them and to seize them and then to really, you know, be able to take action. Thank you very much. Excellently answered. Um, I believe we're, we're going to head to uh, audience Q&A. Um, just before we do, to summarize everything that I've heard there, there's some consistent themes around, um, well, a belief that I've had for quite a long time, which is if you need something, if you need to feel less afraid, to feel more secure, to feel more uh, confident in your future, the easiest way to do that is to help somebody else feel that as well. It works a treat every single time. Whether that is an opportunity to create for somebody else, to give somebody else some certainty, or to work together as a collaborative community, that is the future. That is the way that this generation will create the future we want through collaboration and collective work, not competition. Um, Christine, I believe we have some uh, audience Q&As. 
Absolutely. So first and foremost, let's definitely give another round of applause. This is amazing. The last panel of the day, Youth Resiliency and the Emerging Future. A lot of content was shared in this. So I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, send them on the Q&A feed. YMCA team, please fill questions from social media so we can engage that on the chat feed as well. So as you wait for people to fill the Q&A um, feed with questions, I'll kick off by saying, what tools do you see people are leveraging to build resiliency right now in their communities? Anyone can answer. What tools uh, are you people use? I can jump in. Um, I think that something that we've even been using as part of this event, social media has become so, so important. Um, I see every day when I open Twitter or I open Instagram, I really see um, so many people um, posting about things that they're doing, things that they're involved in, um, ways to kind of keep creating that community and building those connections that we've talked about is so important for the future. Um, so definitely social media is, has been an incredible tool. Anyone else want to jump in? Well, I think it's a really good point. And, and I think, and I, I'm going to, you know, again, underline, I am older than most of you. And so I'm aware of this. Um, I don't understand TikTok. I just don't. Um, that's a strength. Understand that as youth advocates, you are several steps ahead of those who make decisions. Do not forget that having that insider knowledge, that, that platform that you understand that you can, you can manage yourselves gives you a distinct advantage. And so to Karan's point, lean into that. Use those facilities because other people don't, like me don't get it. Yeah, and enough questions to go into this panel. This panel was all about resiliency, right? And our generation, speaking of cross generations, have been through two economic recessions already. One in 2008 and now one 12 years later in 2020. How do you think the youth will prepare for future opportunities knowing that they just experienced two economic recessions? What is your outlook on this? Anyone no. can take a question. Do you know what? I, I think that some of that has to come down to when, when we talk about preparing ourselves, you know, it's not just thinking about the money in our pocket. It's also thinking about our mind, about our body and, and our spirit as has been a recurring theme throughout kind of digital events I've taken part in. Um, and, and I think a lot of it comes down to people being comfortable with where they are and who they are and what they are able to do. And if you wake up one day and laying in bed, watching, eating pizza or, or whatever that looks like for you is what you can do on that day. That is fine. Um, but then, you know, in the future, knowing that that is something that you can work on and you can take forward and where that path leads you on, that's, that's your path. That's your journey. No one can tell you where that journey goes. Amazing. Another question coming in here on the Q and A feed from John Ray. How important is the youth's role in shaping the emerging future brought by the new normal? Loaded because the new normal has several definitions. So who want to take that on? All right, I'll do that. If I, I, I think to start with, it is important that young people do not for whatever reason, underestimate or downplay the ongoing challenges we all faced with. And it's wide uncertainties. I mean, we should be very clear about this. It is possible for someone to ask a question around this, but I still do not mean it. But I mean, we are faced with a real challenge. A challenge with uncertainties we are not clear about. Yeah, and trust me, this virus has turned the world upside down and the change is brought, I, I, I describe as, you know, very disruptive. Very disruptive because, I mean, you talk about a 2008 recession. That recession, that recession did not inhibit travel. I mean, in that scope, we still could engage ourselves from one part of the world to the other physically. But in this circumstance, we are inhibited. I mean, we are unable to do a number of things that hitherto we could do. And my, my simple advice is we, we need to believe in ourselves and show love to each other. 
I know that in spite of the disruption you know, caused to our various aspects of lives, there are some amazing opportunities um, that have come up and still emerging for us to grab, grasp, you know, keeping, you know, keeping safe, staying safe, you know, observing all the, you know, protocols of hand washing and, and I mean, I would want to indicate that using hand sanitizer is never a replacement for hand washing in the very rare event that you do not have access to soap and running water, you can make do with the hand sanitizer. But let's ensure that we keep safe because if we don't have the health, of course, as young people, we won't have the reality to push our agenda for tomorrow. Uh, we need each other now ever more than before. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for that because that was very insightful to plug that. And I think the last question that um, any of you could take is coming in from Jenny, should we be fearful for the future? How can we be brave? Loaded last question there. I'm, I'm really glad that that question is being asked actually because we are the last panel and, and I'm sure having spoken to all of the panelists, they are passionate, optimistic people. Um, and, and as I said, this is partly therapy for me to feel more hopeful. Um, and, and that aside, speaking to each of you, I am ever more certain that the future is positive. Um, the world is going to be okay. We are going to be okay because there are people like you, people who are on this stream, who are watching, who, who care, who want to see the world better, who aren't satisfied with just saying, well, that's how it is. Things should change. Um, if possible, I, I'd love to ask, um, and Christine, give me a virtual smack if, if, I'm not, if we are out of time. Um, from each of you, just very, very succinctly, in a couple of words, say the world goes the way you want it to. What does that look like? What is your utopia? What is your, your best vision of the future? Couple of words, each one of you. Okay, I'll Anna. start. Oh, oh. Kiran. <laughs> um, uh, unity and cooperation. Uh, cooperation and resilience. Young people in politics. All right. So, equal. yes, equal. Yours as well. Your two words. Cohesion and more friendliness. Amazing. Thank you so much for that final question. Another round of virtual applause for our last panel of the day. Resiliency and the emerging future. We're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. We still have more to come. Let's transition over to our last encouragement video from Wadia Al Hamza from the Global Shapers community and Harlem Globetrotters. Let's transition to this video. Dear young people, greetings from Geneva, Switzerland. My name is Wadi Eid Hamza and I'm the head of the Global Shapers community at the World Economic Forum. In these difficult times, it's crucial for young people to voice out their opinions. 50% of the world population is under 30 years old, and usually the young people are seen as the problem. Today, we need to change that narrative to young people are part of the solutions. Thanks to so many organizations like YMCA, Global Shapers Community, and others, young people are on the front of response to COVID-19, for example, or climate change. We should not forget our priorities and get the young people to be at the seat wherever any decisions can be made about our future. Young people are thinking about sustainability, thinking about how can we not leave anyone behind and you should be part of it. If you don't do it, there is no one else that can do it. And we count on you, I count on you, so that we can change the world to be a better place for everyone. Hello to YMCA members, staff, volunteers, and young people all over the world. This is Chris Handles Franklin of the world famous Harlem Globetrotters. And as Harlem Globetrotters, we are ambassadors of goodwill. We travel all over the globe spreading joy, positivity, and bringing people together in unity. As we go through these difficult times, Young people, more than ever, your voice is needed. 
We need your ideas, your creativity, your passion. We need your greatness. Both the YMCA and the Harlem Globetrotters are advocates of youth empowerment. So as we persevere through these times, I encourage our youth all over the world to lead us through these difficult days. We need you. The world needs your energy and your leadership now more than ever as we work towards a brighter and better tomorrow. Together, we can change the world. With that, before we transition to our final keynote of the day, I want to end by saying that, you know, today you guys were sincerely making history. The Wall YMCA has hosted one of their first virtual conferences. The World YMCA has been around for over 175 years. Can we first give a huge round of virtual applause to the World YMCA and the entire YMCA community for bringing this virtual conference to you, to all the nationalities from around the world that came together to talk about well-being, mental health, economic opportunity, the future of work, resilience. These are the topics, climate change, that were discussed today in such a powerful way. And the uniqueness that the YMCA provided all of you today to not only have pioneering voices from the United Nations, from Forbes, all these major organizations speaking to you today, but to couple that with the voices of the youth. How many times have you been a part of conferences, leading conferences where our decision makers are there making decisions in the room Room. And we as young people are not in the room to give our voice, our perspective, and like it was said today, claim your space. The world needs you. The world does not need anyone else to make a change. We are going through unprecedented times, but it has happened before. We have been through pandemics. We have been through economic recessions. We have been through global, global catastrophes before, and we said no, that this too shall pass. And as we look out to the future and see what we were exposed to today at the YMCA, you were exposed to so many different perspectives. We do hope you were inspired, you were informed, you were empowered to not make excuses, to not say what you don't have, to not say what you can do, and realize that you will always have the power and the voice to make things happen. And who better to inspire you than today, the World YMCA? Because if you look at how long the World YMCA has been around, who would have thought the place that you called home, for many of you, the World YMCA, the YMCA, your local YMCA, was your place of refuge, opportunity, action. And now virtually, we're calling to action again for you to step up and not only connect with your local YMCA, but do more. Ask more of your decision makers. And if your decision makers are not making the change, you gotta make the change for them because the world needs more young people to be empowered. And I hope that you were inspired by today's sessions and you learned the power of what you have in your hands to not only take us to another generational future, but to also lead that change. So with that, I wanna thank you all for being a part of this session. Again, my name is Christine and Tim. I'm the CMO of the Global Startup Ecosystem, your MC and your host for the day. And it truly was a privilege to engage with all of you, to hear all the panelists. This is a virtual round of applause for our virtual panelists, our moderators, our partners, our sponsors, and of course, the World YMCA Alliance team for making history as they always do each and every day by empowering 65 million people from around the world. Thank you so much for bringing this virtual conference to all of us. And with that, I'll pass it over to our Secretary General, Carla Sanvi, for closing remarks. Congratulations, everyone. You just made Haiti a history with the 2020 edition of the World YMCA, the future we want. Pass it over to you, Carlos. Thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. What is an incredible moment. I'm so proud. Thank you all. But I want to first thank our expert moderator. I couldn't believe myself that we have so talented people in our movement and outside the movement, people who enjoy the presence, who help the YMCA. Thank you for this series of eyes opening discussion on health and well being economic opportunity and the future of work, climate justice, youth resiliency, and the emerging future. Sema, Amos, Alessandria, and William, 
thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being part of this global family. We really, really appreciate your time. It's important that we foster intergenerational connection. And with your help, you are going to keep this crucial dialogue going. Thank you. I want also to thank all our 16 youth panel speakers. We know to choose 16 out of million was not an easy job, but we are sure we, we want this to be a series. So each of our talented young people all across the world, you be assured that you will have the opportunity to be a speaker. So thank you, the speaker, for your insight. And you gave us hope. I personally have a lot of hope for the future. I've heard many things during this uh, few minutes, uh, hour we spent together. The first one that, that stick to my mind that yes, we are going through fearful moment, but there is a hope because the young people, you have a vision, you have a personal calling that you can work on. That's very, very positive. I also hear from you that you are equipped, young people are equipped and adaptable for this moment. And that is where the hope is coming from. Because if you don't have that resilience that is inbuilt, uh, we, we cannot make it to the next level. I hear um, from other messages that it's important that you know, you feel that we believe in you and that you can bring the change. Yes, um, you have to claim the space, you have to raise your voice and you have to stand up for what you believe in. And some of those things you believe in is the climate justice, is the future of work. We know that there is a lot of divide uh, we know that there's an inequality all over the places, but young people, you stand for that. And we are here as a YMCA to hold the space for you and to make things happen. We are with you in this mission and to create this global space for young people, to share your idea and to connect with your peers from all over the world. And today's event highlighted how important it is to really listen to you, young people. I want to thank our amazing host, Christine Tim. Wow, Christine, what a dynamic. Thank you very much. You brought so much energy and insight, and we are so grateful to you. Heartfelt thank you to the UN Youth Envoy for her inspiring keynote and special thanks to all the role model and senior leaders who shared video message and encouragement, including the UN Secretary General. Thank you to the event committee and staff and to the all YMCA all over the world who made this today possible. Special thank to my staff here at the World Alliance for all the sacrifice they put to make this happen. Now I'd like to invite everyone to continue the conversation. Yes, continue the conversation by joining the virtual cafe here on Zoom. Link have been provided. I know many people have been already in those Zoom room for the virtual conversation. Uh, those for you, uh, of you watching on Facebook and YouTube, check your chat box and please click the link and also share your email. If you would like to be informed about our next Youth Voices, even and perhaps consider you as a future youth panel speaker. It is time now, my friends and dear leaders around the world, to make your voice heard. You are the leader. We need today and you are with you. So thank you. See you in the, in the cafe and stay tuned. We are hopeful because you are in charge. Thank you very much. All right, let's see all of you at the virtual cafe. It is not over yet. Let's continue and transition to the virtual cafe. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>